Hi, I'm Robert Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Uh, thanks so much for joining the program. The last few episodes have been really well received and it's been gratifying to see our regular audience growing so swiftly. If you haven't subscribed already, search for the 80,000 Hours podcast wherever you get your podcasts and that way you'll um, never miss an episode about something you're interested in and you can listen when you're walking or cleaning or whatever you like to do and you can speed up the conversation as uh, much or as little as you like. Today's episode is the longest one so far at two and a half hours, but if you listen through, you'll end up knowing a hell of a lot about why pandemics are such a scary threat and what we can uh, do to, to reduce their probability and their severity. We've put an index in the show notes and the associated blog posts, so you can look through and skip to any section that you're particularly interested in if you prefer. So enjoy. <laughs> Today, I'm speaking with Howie Lempel, who until recently was a program officer for the Open Philanthropy Project, where he's worked on problems including biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. For those who don't know, the Open Philanthropy Project is a foundation whose goal is to make philanthropy go especially far in terms of improving lives. It's the main philanthropic vehicle for Kari Tuna and her husband, Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskowitz, who are expected to give about $8 billion over the course of their lives. And full disclosure, 80,000 Hours' biggest donor is actually the Open Philanthropy Project. But prior to working at the Open Philanthropy Project, or Open Phil as we call it, Howie studied at Yale Law School and worked for the Brookings Institution and various criminal justice reform organizations. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Rob. Really excited to be here. So we plan to talk about the nature of the risks from pandemics, uh, what can be done about them, and uh, how listeners can best use their career to reduce the threat. But first, uh, what did you work on at the Open Philanthropy Project? Sure. So when I started at the Open Philanthropy Project, it was a brand new organization. Um, It was kind of like a mix between being a large foundation and having the feel of a smaller startup. And so that meant that at the beginning, everybody was a bit of a generalist. And so when we started, our first major project was deciding what areas of philanthropy, what problems and causes seemed especially promising for open fills giving. And so for my first year or so, my main work was doing research to that end. Um, And the questions that we asked to sort of choose our program areas were, could we find causes that had you know, a really big scope or scale of the problem that we were trying to solve that really affected a lot of people and had a big effect in their lives, um, where it didn't seem like there was enough philanthropy that already existed, um, and also where it seemed like there were concrete things that more money could do to help. And so uh, we started with this huge list of Um, you know, all of the causes that seemed like they could be potential candidates. And I was one of the people at the start who did really sort of shallow looks at each of those causes. Um, So talking to, you know, maybe two or three experts and getting their sense of helping us understand what the problem was in that area, um, what people were already working on, what sort of important possible solutions there were that people weren't working on yet, and you sort of getting their sense of what philanthropy could do in the area. And so my job at first involved both reading up, sort of quickly getting to know a lot of different areas, um, and then going out and reaching out to the real experts in the field and trying to get their sense of what more philanthropy would do in each of those areas. And then over time, as we started to specialize, um, you know, the job kind of changed as we dug in dug in more. So this is extremely similar to what 80,000 Hours does, um, or at least part of what we do. And I think we actually copied the, the framework that you were using initially. So our, our problem framework is to look for uh, issues in the world that are really large in scale that not many people are working on and where it seems like you could you could easily make a difference by spending more resources. So uh, like scale, neglectedness, and, and tractability, uh, we call it. Um, and we've, we've, we've relied on Open Philanthropy Project's uh, research quite a bit in, in forming our own list. Uh, so I guess, I guess the openness uh, has, has been pretty useful for us. Yeah, so I think um, the same types of questions that 80,000 Hours is asking when they're thinking about how someone can do as much good as they can with their career, um, that's the type of question that Open Philanthropy is asking, but thinking about 
um, you know, how a foundation can do as much good as they can with uh, donating money. And I suppose that there are, there are some differences there between where you need talent to go and where you need money to go, but because they can convert between one another, it's a, it's a pretty similar problem. Absolutely. So a lot of what OpenPhil did in the early days is what we call a global priorities research, trying to figure out, you know, working on which uh, problem you can, you can have the largest impact with, with your money or your career. And uh, I think in the future, we'll probably have a full episode devoted just, just to that uh, topic. Uh, it's, it's one of our recommended uh, areas because there's very few people doing it. And it seems like you can, you can have a very large impact by uh, shifting resources from problems that are somewhat uh, less pressing for the world towards uh, problems that are, that, are, that are much more pressing. Um, and potentially, we're, we're, we're not allocating resources in a very um, effective way overall because there's just not many people who are trying to make these prioritization decisions, uh, trying to figure out, you know, do you, do you accomplish more good by focusing on health or education or on these kind of global catastrophic risks or, or something else completely different? And so uh, OpenPhil has been able to make quite, quite a lot of progress in a short amount of time just by looking at something on which, on which not a lot of people had already tried uh, to work. Is, is OpenPhil a place that you would recommend uh, people work? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, you know, working at OpenPhil is one of the best career decisions I've made. And um, I think it's one of the best places in the world to work on, mm. on cause prioritization type issues issues um, because I think it's pretty unique in that it is open to so many causes and really cares about cause prioritization, um, but also has the resources to actually, once it chooses a cause, make a real a real bet in that cause. Mm-hmm. And I think that that um, really uh, is a good learning opportunity when you're working on cause prioritization. Mm-hmm. So knowing that you're eventually going to actually have to make a bet and that the organization is going to make grants, I think sort of imposes some discipline mm. on... Focuses um, the mind. Yeah, I think that that's right. And then also, um, I think there are certain questions that it forces you to ask about, you know, how much money could this field actually absorb? Mm. Um, you know, like, uh, are there good reasons why X area is, is neglected that you would only know if you talk to potential grantees, um, that type of thing, that it's pretty hard to get if you're not in the position of a grant maker. Um, so I think it's a pretty unique place to do that, that type of work. And yeah, I definitely recommend it for, for people who, yeah. who are interested. Do you know if they're hiring at the moment? I don't. don't. Okay, yeah. Well, we'll stick up a link to their vacancies page. Uh, uh, I, I don't know whether they're hiring right now, but uh, they might well be at some point in the next six months or a year. So uh, you can potentially get on their mailing list and find out about that. What was your research work at OpenPhil like day to day? Yeah, so I depended on exactly what task I was working on, but a lot of the work was first spending as much time as I could really talking to experts in the field and learning from them. So it was a lot of um, you know phone calls, reaching out to to top people, um, you know reading and trying to get to know a field well enough that I knew you know. Identify as quickly as possible the sort of main open questions that would affect whether or not we wanted to enter a cause area, and then try and figure out, uh, mostly through internet research, academic research, uh, you know, who the people were who could answer those questions, and then trying to, to reach out to them and, you know, get their answers. Then once we identified areas as particularly promising, the work changed a little bit. And there were some cause areas where the next step was really to go out and find grant-making opportunities. Um, That involved a lot of going to conferences, getting to know everybody in the field, trying to understand what role every different organization played, whether there were things that seemed like gaps to us, types of organizations that really ought to exist and didn't, or organizations whose work we would really like to expand. Um, and then go out and make grants ourselves. Um, sometimes for program areas where we really felt like we needed an expert or a specialist to, um, you know, scale up our grant making who, you know, had instead of whatever amount of expertise I can get in a few months of learning about an area, um, you know, there are people who have spent years and years building up their networks and expertise. So sometimes my job was really to find that person and go out and try to recruit someone. Um, and again, that actually involved relatively similar work. The difference between taking a bet on an individual who you're going to then give the responsibility to do all of your grant making versus taking a bet on an organization who you're going to grant to is pretty similar. So it's a lot of going out into the field, making sure everybody knows my face, going to conferences, getting to know people, and getting them to building a trusting relationship so then you can ask them for their advice on 
who we ought to hire to um, go and run a program area. So did did people suck up to you a lot because you had a lot of money to give away? Was yeah. it hard to know who to trust? I think that's one of the hardest parts of working for a foundation um, is, you know, there's a pretty awkward relationship where you have, um, you know, a, a lot of power and, um, you know, people really do want to please you. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of work to sort of build a trusting relationship where people feel like they can give you negative feedback. People, um, you know, feel like they can be honest with you. And yeah, I think that was a, that's a major challenge working at a foundation. Yeah. So do you think the work had a large impact? Um, I really do think it did. Um, I think that, um, you know, there are relatively few foundations like Open Fill that are large and have that level of resources and that also have Open Fill's openness to really going into almost any cause area um, where it feels like it can make the biggest difference. And so... I think that OpenFill really was able to find some areas where there was nobody available to um, give the kind of philanthropy that was needed um, and really make a big difference. So one area that's um, really important to me is working on reducing the suffering caused by uh, factory farming. And Open Phil was able to enter that area and become really one of the, the largest donors in that area. Um, and similarly, in the area that we're talking about, pandemics and biosecurity, it's an area where there's a lot of funding by governments, but there are certain activities that really can't be done by governments. Um, so something like political advocacy or policy advocacy um, often can't be done by governments. There's sort of certain really sensitive questions that governments often, you know, can't really work on. And so I think it's really important to have private sector money in there to sort of hold governments accountable. I think that that's something that Open Phil really was able to do in an important area. And it was really clear that there weren't many other foundations in the area, um, you know, available to give that kind of funding. You're saying, in a sense, uh, the, the field isn't neglected in terms of what governments can do, or not so neglected, but then in terms of what independent actors, non-government actors can do, th those things often aren't getting done because there's just no one there. Well, I would say that there are two issues, and one of them is exactly what you said. It's an area where, um, you know, public health is one of the big priorities of a lot of governments, um, and so there is a lot of spending in that area. Um, by governments, there was almost no spending on things like policy advocacy, sort of think tanks, the whole, you know, uh, NGO sector that usually exists in important policy fields um, was really neglected. Then there's a second issue, which is, um, you know, my sort of, the main thing that I care about in this area, and Open Phil's priority, was in particular reducing the chance of you know, the worst case scenarios among pandemics, things that could really be what we called global catastrophes. Um, and I think that that's something that governments often aren't quite able to focus on as much as we might like. Um, you know, they often work in very short time cycles. Um, you know, Congress has to renew funding every couple of years for most agencies. Um, and so it's really hard for governments to sort of focus on the long run, focus on things that might not be likely, but that would be, you know, a really big, uh, have a really big impact if they were to occur. And I think that if you want governments to be able to work on those type of things, you really need some, uh, you know, advocacy to back them up, um, to sort of subsidize that work from the private sector. So I think we were both able to have, you know, fill that gap in the private sector that there wasn't that much philanthropy. And then also, you know, uh, I'm hoping that open philanthropy will be able to support the government, uh, you know, through advocacy and allow it to really prioritize some of the stuff that we thought was most important. Does open Phil work on any other problem areas where, where the situation is similar? Um, I actually think that this was pretty unique among open Phil's, uh, cause areas, at least while I was there, um, because open Phil really does prioritize um, 
areas that are both very important and also neglected. Um, often that meant it was areas that were neglected even by the public sector. And so biosecurity and pandemic preparedness stood out to us as an area that was a little bit different because it does have uh, you know, a relatively large amount of spending um, by governments, but that still seemed like there were big gaps. Um, the other thing that's sort of unique about this area is that it's a little hard to define exactly what counts as you know, spending to reduce pandemics. Um, so there's a lot of work on public health in general that would be helpful from the perspective of pandemic preparedness, but that maybe isn't the top thing that you might prioritize if all you cared about was reducing risk from pandemics, or in particular, reducing risk from the types of pandemics that could really be global catastrophes. Um, and so if you look narrowly at um, you know, interventions that are specifically focused just on, on uh, lowering risk from that type of pandemic, then even governments, I would say, really, really neglect that. Mm. So there's, uh, you know, just general public health spending designed at, uh, for disease control. That is, is better than nothing, but it's not the thing that you'd be most interested in doing if you were just focused on preventing a pandemic that could kill a really large number of people and was completely new. Exactly. Mm. What kind of grants did you make in the area while you were at OpenPhil? Yes. What, or what grants did OpenPhil make? Um, so the main priority for most of the time I was there was actually not grant making, but it was getting to know the area really well, start to set our strategy, and... Um, we made our hire of somebody who's an expert in the field, Jamie Yasef, who's now running the program area. Um, but we did make a couple of grants while I was there. Um, one of them was to a blue ribbon panel on biodefense in Washington, DC. Um, we gave them to start for their first year about $300,000 of our funding. They also had a bunch of other funding from other organizations. Um, and what they did was they got a panel of, you know, real sort of policy luminaries, former policymakers in DC, um, to convene a set of meetings and identify real priorities in United States biodefense policy. Um, so figuring out, you know, what the biggest improvements could be made to prevent risks to the United States, um, you know, from, from epidemics, not necessarily just things that could be global catastrophe, but natural epidemics and also, you know, the potential use of bioweapons or potential biological accidents. And so they put out a big report sort of identifying priority areas. And their goal was really both to identify priority areas, which is difficult because there are so many different um, you know, types of work that can be done in this field, and to really call attention in sort of the internal DC world to this as an important topic. Um, so we supported supported their work. And that was one of the first grants that we made in the area. Hmm. How, how do you think it went? Um, so I haven't been there for all of the follow-up. And um, it'd be great for um, some folks to, at some point, talk to um, the, the new program officer, uh, Jamie, about it. But um, our sort of initial impression is, number one, this type of thing is sort of setting the stage for hopefully having policy changes in the future. And it was largely trying to you know, convene the biodefense community and call attention. So we didn't really expect you know, policy change to immediately happen, but I think that the initial signs were incredibly successful. Um, so they were able to get a meeting with the vice president, Vice President Joe Biden at the time, um, and sort of had some follow-up with his staff. Um, they were able to get several hearings in front of Congress um, and there were, there's at least, you know, some people who seemed like, some members of Congress who seemed like they might really have the potential to become champions of this cause and really bring it on as one of their priorities, um, who seemed to learn a lot from the hearings. So that was, um, you know, uh, seemed to be like really good initial signs of success. And OpenPhil actually, since then, has renewed the grant and given them more funding to, to continue the work and to sort of do follow-up work saying, we identified these priorities, you know, has the government made any progress since then? Are there any other grants that it would be interesting to talk about? Yeah, I think a second one that was really interesting was a grant 
to an organization called iGEM, which is actually a student competition um, where undergrad students work on you know, really sort of cutting edge synthetic biology projects, um, which essentially means that they are you know, combining DNA themselves to modify organisms um, you know, to do really useful things. Um, so, you know, one example that was neat is that you can modify bacteria and basically make that bacteria into a sensor. So you can have it, you know, an example that was really cool was a, a project where students created a sort of drug testing bacteria. So someone could find out whether or not, you know, some drug heroin was pure or whether it had been adulterated um, by basically having the bacteria react differently to different, um, you know, types of, uh, of the drug. And it's really exciting work. Some of the really, you know, cutting edge synthetic biology um, is happening there. And also a lot of those undergrads are going to grow up and be, you know, some of the top synthetic biologists down the road. Um, and, you know, we were really excited about, about the work that they're doing, um, but it's pretty easy to see how in the long run, you know, this ability for, um, you know, more and more people to be able to modify organisms could also come with, you know, safety and security risks. Um, so OpenPhil gave a grant to iGEM's safety and security team to give them more resources to do things like train those students in you know, how to um, you know, work safely with the organisms they were working with. Because right now, the iGEM students are you know, not working with anything particularly dangerous, but those same students down the road could be working with um, you know, more, more dangerous organisms. Um, and then um, you know, give them resources to teach the students about you know, security culture and sort of teach them to be you know, guardians of science. And synthetic biology as a field can only really work if you have a culture where everybody realizes that you know, this is a technology that could have huge benefits, could also have huge risks. And so the goal of the grant was both to give iGEM resources to you know, have a really good safety and security program, um, but also to be able to experiment a little bit with that program. Because down the road, what we really want is you know, not just this one competition to have a really good safety and security program, but to know in general, you know, what types of things work for creating a you know, culture of safety and security in the DIY bio community in general. Hmm. Do you know whether that grant worked out yet? I think it's sort of still too early to tell. Um, so you know, I think we'll, we'll find out down the road. So we've touched on it, but now let's, let's really uh, dive into the nature of the, of the pandemic uh, risks we face. Uh, why is pandemic preparedness such an important thing to work on, like possibly like the most important thing for people to be working on? Sure. So I think the way to start to approach that question is to ask, and the way that Open Phil originally approached that question was to first ask, why do we care so much about working on reducing global catastrophic risk in general. And that ended up being a real priority for the Open Philanthropy Project because, um, you know, we care a lot both about the well-being of current people, um, but also about the well-being of people you know, down the road in future generations, really, you know, protecting, um, you know, all of the, the good things that civilization has brought for uh, you know, people down the line. And um, so we started out by asking, you know, right now that you know, we have this trajectory where global poverty has been going down for a long period of time. It seems like the well-being of most people on earth has been getting much better. And there's a lot of hope that in the future that will continue to happen. Are there things that could really destroy that, set us off track? Um, and so we went through a process of looking at um, you know, the, the sort of main candidates for events that could really you know, disrupt that progress. And you know, we looked at everything from climate change to pandemics to risks from um, you know, emerging technologies to war. asteroids, war, yeah, um, you know, nuclear conflict, um, and tried to ask, you know, try to first ask, what would it take to really get civilization off track. 
And the sort of heuristic that we came up with is we tried to ask, what are the events that could lead to something like hundreds of millions of deaths in a short period of time? And when we asked that, um, and then asked, you know, limited it to areas where there wasn't enough philanthropy yet, and where, uh, you know, there were, you know, apparent things that philanthropy could really do about it, uh, biosecurity and pandemic preparedness was really towards the top. And I can sort of go through a few reasons why that was the case. Um, and so when we talk about biosecurity and pandemic preparedness, we usually split it into two categories. One of them is risks from natural pandemics. Um, you know, it could be everything from, um, you know, the flu to smallpox to HIV and AIDS. Um, and the other is risks from pandemics that might be caused by, by humans. And so that kind of splits into two categories. One of them is um, you know, potentially the use of biological weapons. A second is the possibility of an outbreak that starts from a lab accident. So somebody doing research, working with potentially dangerous organisms, and um, you know, accidentally allows some of that to get out and starts an outbreak that way. And we looked into you know, both of those as part of the cause area. Um, and natural pandemics, at least in the short run, seem much more likely to occur. Uh, you know, we have a long history of natural pandemics occurring. Um, you know, we had several natural pandemics um, over the last century. Um, you know, most recently was the um, flu pandemic in 2009. Um, and you know, new outbreaks are emerging all the time. And so if we just want to ask, you know, what's the most likely source of, um, you know, a big outbreak uh, over the next several years, that's going to be where it comes from. And then the second question that we ask is, could a natural pandemic really get to that level of a global catastrophe? Um, and that's a more difficult question for us. Um, you know, we have a lot of examples of outbreaks that were definitely tragedies, um, where there were thousands of deaths that could have been preventable. But we also have some pretty good evidence of society sort of coming back and being fairly resilient um, and making it through those, those events. Um, so when we wanted to ask, you know, could a natural pandemic really rise to the level of, um, you know, our sort of threshold of hundreds of millions of deaths? Um, the main thing that we looked at for evidence was the Spanish flu, which occurred um, back in 1918. Um, and, you know, that pandemic um, killed about three to five percent of the world population, which if you sort of projected that out to today, um, you know, ends yeah, up... 100 million, at, 200 million. Yeah, exactly. Deaths. Um, so that sort of at least gave us a sense that a, you know, one in a hundred year type pandemic, you know, might reach that threshold. They're then really difficult questions about if that occurred today, you know, would it be, you know, similarly bad? Um, and I think it's hard to know. And having talked to a lot of the experts in the field, opinions really differ. On the one hand, healthcare has gotten better. On the other hand, you know, we've had globalization and outbreaks can spread a lot faster. Um, so when we, you know, look at at least the possibility, um, you know, it seems possible that you really could have uh, a pandemic of that size from natural causes. There's also just a lot more people in some very dense cities, right? Yeah. It's very difficult to control diseases, right? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a factor too. And then there are, you know, phenomena like global warming, which some folks at least think could really, uh, you know, increase pandemic risk in the near future as it, you know, forces people to migrate a little bit um, and sort of move to areas and come into contact with, animals and you know disease reservoirs that they haven't touched before so the spanish flu in 1918 19 killed three to five percent which today yep. would be 200 million 300 million but that wasn't even the the, the worst pandemic in history right because it also had like the black death and yep. uh, smallpox when it got to the americas 
or I, I've read stats where you know as high as fifty percent of the population have died in, or we think historically they died in the, in the very worst cases when the Black Death came through some parts of Europe. Is is that is that right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if we've gotten up to fifty percent of the global population. Oh no, oh, globally no, yeah, yeah um, just locally. Right. Mm. Um, but um, so you know there are two questions that you ask when you want to ask, you know, how severe a pandemic is. And one of them is how wide it spreads. And the second one is how likely someone who catches it is to die. Um, and so there are definitely examples of pathogens that killed a much higher proportion of people who were infected than the Spanish flu did. Um, Black death is a really good example. Um, and yeah, Spanish flu is sort of the most recent example mm. of one that, you know, sort of hit Had a bit of threshold, but it's not, um, you know, it's definitely not the only case. Mm. And importantly, it's not like, a, you know, theoretical worst case scenario. Mm. Um, so the specific strain of flu that caused, um, you know, the Spanish flu pandemic, it was incredibly contagious. It wasn't one of the most deadly strains of flu that's known. Um, and so you can at least imagine the possibility of a strain that's as contagious as the Spanish flu, but that's closer to having the fatality rate of some of the more dangerous flus out there. And that would be a whole, a whole lot worse. So, so how many people could die? What are we talking about here? Is, is billions like possible? Um, so I think that the answer is it's possible and there's no way to rule it out. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it's likely that that will happen in the you know next hundred years. Um, and we don't have any examples yet of a natural pandemic that have sort of been that severe. Um, but there's nothing ruling it out. Um, and you know, we do have this example from only a hundred years ago um, that you know gets at least within an order of magnitude of that severe. And reason to believe that things could get worse. Mm. Do, do you want to uh, say what you think the chances are that one of us might die in a, in a global pandemic? Um, so I'm not sure if I could get a um, you know, really good estimate there. And having talked to uh, you know, almost all of the, or a lot of experts in the field, most of them are not really willing to, to give an estimate. But um, something that really struck me is some of Bill Gates's writing on the topic. Um, and he, a couple years ago, put out an article where he said that if anything is going to kill more than 10 million people around the world in the next few decades, the most likely thing is a pandemic, either from natural causes or from bioterrorism. So as far as big disasters that, you know, you or me ought to be worried about, um, I really think it's, it's right up there. Hmm. A lot of people will have seen the film Contagion, which was an attempt to make a scientifically accurate film about how a new disease could spread and the effects it would have, uh, how people would die and, and, and the social implications that that would have. Uh, so, so in the film, uh, a new disease uh, moves from, from bats to humans, I think, in, in Hong Kong, uh, from memory. And it spreads around the world and it, it's, it's quite contagious and quite virulent and... Uh, there's, you know, difficult questions about uh, how quickly can we make a vaccine and who's going to get access to the vaccine first uh, when we're talking about, you know, several percent of the population uh, dying. Uh, did, did you think this, this film was on point? You've seen it, right? Yeah, I've seen it. It's been a, it's been a few years, yeah. so I can't vouch for all of the details. Um, but I can talk to you a little bit. I've actually talked to one or two of the experts who consulted on the film. Um, and I can talk a little bit about, um, you know, their, their view and... I noticed myself talking a lot about you know, having spoken to experts. Um, and so I think I should pause really quickly just to clarify that I myself, um, you know, spent, uh, you know, a year, year and a half trying to get up to speed on this topic. But, you know, don't consider myself to be, you know, quite an expert in the area. I certainly don't have a, a science or a medical background. Um, so everybody who's listening should sort of, you know, take all these views as, you know, my personal views based on a novice who tried to get to know the field. Um, and certainly, you know, not, um, not the views of open philanthropy where I used to work um, or the views of 
um, you know, any, any specific experts, because there's a lot of disagreement in the field. Um, but sure. getting back to um, the movie Contagion, um, I do think it was a, you know, fairly accurate science-based portrayal of, you know, the, the type of really bad scenario that plausibly could happen. Um, and the makers of the film really wanted it to be sort of a, a real warning shot. Um, and so they wanted it to be accurate enough that it could, it could serve that purpose. And so it's a Hollywood movie. Um, it means that stuff is dramatized. Um, but it did a really good job of showing a bunch of the really serious problems that could face um, you know, efforts to deal with a really severe pandemic. Um, and, you know, you're going to, you know, in that scenario, you're going to have a lot of really you know, difficult decisions to make about how to distribute vaccines, how to get the public, you know, when the public is really scared to take advice of public health officials, um, you know, all of those, those types of things. And I think the movie did a really good job of showing, you know, one by one, each sort of set of difficulties that could occur as authorities try to detect and learn about and respond to a really serious outbreak. Mm. So the first time I tried to uh, watch this film, I was actually uh, on a plane. And uh, that's uh, the plane's feature in the film is like, mm -hmm. one of the ways that these diseases are spreading. And of course, the yeah, airports are going to be one of the first places that they show up. Uh, and actually, I, I did manage to get through it because I was starting to get this uh, constant desire to go to the bathroom on the plane and wash my hands. Uh, so I so I set that aside and watched a funny film and then, it then, was, then uh, watched it later. It was pretty terrifying. It yeah. hits the, the sort of um, you know magic point where it both has the plausibility mm -hmm. of this is a type of a disaster that actually could happen um, and also sort of scary in the way that like some of the worst horror films can be yeah it's too scary to dismiss so yes. if 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 you're someone who uh enjoys uh, i guess documentaries or uh, realistic films about horrible things then uh definitely go go and check out uh contagion i think it'll make it a, a bit more vivid uh, what what kind of thing uh, it's, it's possible possible that we might end up living through um, so what are the biological uh, risks that, that worry you the most? What are the, like, how, how would a worst case scenario emerge? It's a good question. And so I should clarify that so far we've mostly talked about natural pandemics, hmm. which are, you know, a very serious problem and something I think ought to be taken very seriously. But when we're talking about biological catastrophes that could, you know, really reach the scale where they, you know, have a, a really long-run impact. I think that, um, you know, catastrophes caused by humans actually are an even bigger concern. Um, and so, you know, over history so far, I think we've gotten really lucky that we've had fairly few examples of accidents or, um, you know, terrorist incidents or weaponization of, um, of diseases. But I think that it's going to be harder and harder over time, or at least it might be, to make sure that that stays the case. Um, and so we're sort of seeing over time that it's becoming easier and easier for more and more people to work with uh, you know, different types of organisms, including you know, some of, of the worst pathogens out there and easier for them to modify them. And, um, you know, with today's technology, um, it's still incredibly hard to make a biological weapon. It's still incredibly hard to, um, you know, modify a pathogen to make it worse than what exists in nature. And it's absolutely possible that that will continue to be the case. But we've seen a lot of really surprising progress over time in fields like synthetic biology that, you know, tries to modify organisms for good reasons and to do good science, but tries to both give scientists the ability to change the characteristics of organisms and also make that technology easier to work with, make it more like a sort of standardized engineering field, um, you know, so that more and more people have access to the technology. And if that type of technology ends up really successful, um, you know, I think that that's the type of scenario where you really have to get worried about how are we going to ensure, you know, safety and security of that field. Because, you know, pathogens don't have any inherent desire to hurt as many people as they can. Um, actually, from an evolutionary perspective, 
they probably don't want to kill all their hosts. Um, and so, you know, there's reason to think that there's some sort of like limit on how bad a natural pandemic would get. Um, but when you start to think about the possibility of somebody with bad intentions, um, you know, taking a really bad pathogen and, you know, making it resistant to the vaccines that we have, um, things like that, um, I think that that's the type of scenario that starts to feel, you know, really scary and that might become, you know, more likely over time. Hmm. And it's not only people with malevolent intentions, right? It's also the military doing this research and then accidentally releasing it or possibly even intentionally releasing it or North Korea releasing something like this in a conflict. And also there's people who uh, do this research that they produce uh, viruses that are resistant to vaccines for research purposes to understand uh, how they can design new vaccines, like how they would respond to this. So what kind of properties would that virus have? But then if a, if a virus like that escapes the lab, then, then we could be talking about millions or tens of millions of fatalities. Yeah, exactly. So I think one really good example of this type of research and a really controversial example um, was a set of experiments from about a decade ago where scientists were working with a strain of flu that is particularly fatal to humans. Um, so it's a strain of flu that has about a 40 or 50% case fatality rate, which means that about half of the humans that get this type of flu um, die from it. And the good thing about this type of flu is that it can't be passed from humans to humans. So humans can get it from animals, um, but then once they get it, they don't pass it on, which means that, you know, in nature, at least if it doesn't continue to evolve, it's pretty limited in terms of its dangerous, dangerousness. Um, but then what these scientists did is they wanted to learn about, you know, could this flu evolve and what would it take for it to evolve so it did become contagious among humans. And so they used, you know, biological techniques to get the flu to evolve over and over again until they're working with ferrets, which are used sort of a, a model of the human respiratory system. And so until this flu that was, you know, incredibly fatal could be passed back and forth between the ferrets. Um, you know, we may have learned something from that research. Um, we also ought to be really happy that there was no type of accident because, you know, that would be very scary if it got out. We don't know for sure, um, you know, how contagious it would have been among humans. Um, it could have been contagious just among the ferrets and not among the humans, but it's an example of, you know, the type of research that could create a pathogen that's actually worse than anything that occurs in nature. Um, and I think we ought to be really careful about what types of regulatory systems we have in place and what types of self-regulatory and governance systems we have in place to make sure that we're being careful when that kind of research is being done. Hmm. So if we were unlucky and that uh, virus escaped the lab and we're also unlucky and it turns out that, that it is contagious between humans and the case fatality rate holds up, we could be talking about a billion fatalities, like really serious uh, social dislocation. Uh, this would be a catastrophe, right? Potentially yeah. one of the worst catastrophes in human history. Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, one way to think about that again is um, you can think about the Spanish flu, which is one of the more contagious strains of flu that exist. Um, and something like half the global population caught that flu. Um, you know, if they were to somehow take the flu that has a 40 or 50% case fatality rate and make it that contagious, which it's not likely that that has happened yet, but, you know, if it were to happen and it were to get out, you can imagine, you know, something like a quarter of the world population, um, being killed. That's like a worst case scenario. Um, but it's pretty scary to know that something like that would even be beyond the table. Hmm. There's a... There's a game, uh, Pandemic, I think, uh, where the, the goal of the player is to kill as many uh, people as possible or to try to, to drive the human uh, species yeah. extinct, I think. Uh, it seems like people in that uh, game always survive in Madagascar. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a famous because Madagascar only has one port and it closes it right away. Uh, I guess that there would always be people in Antarctica or, or on ships and so on who, who would avoid this kind of thing. So it's not really it's not really plausible that like everyone could die from this, but... Uh, like a quarter, you're saying, is, is, is imaginable. Yeah, from, from that type of experiment in like a real, real worst case scenario. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's about right. Um, you know, people have certainly 
come up with, you know, some scenarios that are, you know, really science fiction today, um, but that, you know, if you are really devious and lucky and talented, you know, could be even, even worse. Um, so, uh, I, mean, I think we should always be open to that possibility, but I agree with your basic point that, you know, it's very unlikely that anything will occur that, you know, everyone in the whole world would catch and that nobody would be resistant to. Um, but you then have to ask all the questions about, you know, what type of disruption do we have to like governance and society, you know, um, even from those, from those smaller incidents. Right. So did you or Open Phil form a view on whether there's a risk of widespread social, social collapse if something like a billion people die in a pandemic? Like, because you imagine well, people make this argument with climate change, with, uh, you know, war or nuclear war. So initially it will be bad, but then as all of our systems of trade fall apart, as uh, borders are closed, um, as uh, people, people panic, we're going to have like, you know, declines in the quality of governance and people will turn on one another, like the legal system might break down. And so things will move from bad to very bad. Is that something you have a view on? Um, yeah, so it's a really hard question. And it's one of those questions where I think we won't really know unless it happens. Um, you know, we don't have any, you know, case studies to look back on. Um, that we can say are like, you know, a real analogy to this happening and go one way or the other. Um, and I definitely can't speak for open fill, but my own view is that, no, it's absolutely plausible that um, you know, society would, would come back from an event like that. Um, we have had some real serious disasters that um, the society did come back from. Um, the Spanish flu and, you know, World, World War I and World War II also are sort of pretty good examples of the type of event that you might have expected to really sort of lead to major declines in governance and that we seem to have come back from. But, uh, you know, those did not lead to something like a billion deaths. Um, and, you know, the, the world changes over time. Um, and also, that's only two examples. So I think, personally, we really want to avoid ever taking that type of risk. Um, in the whole you know, history of humankind, it's a pretty short period where we've had things like liberal democracy and you know, these types of institutions that support um, poverty reduction and scientific progress. Um, and so this does seem like the type of thing that's um, you know, potentially a major disruption. And if this does occur, you're going to have governments making a lot of really tough decisions about things like how to allocate vaccines, you know, whether or not lives to cordon and off certain areas, who lives and who dies. And, you know, what that does to the sort of fragile trust that people already have in, in a lot of governments, um, I think is a really, really open question. And so, you know, I think it's pretty important that, um, that the world does anything possible to sort of avoid having to, to learn that answer. Hmm. Yeah, I guess some, some other differences between uh, World War II and the pandemic today are that an international conflict or a war like that produces intense social solidarity within each country. And it's not clear that that carries over to, to a pandemic where you don't have another human enemy that you are rallying against. Although I guess it, I guess it could, could, could be better in some other ways. And of course, just there's a, a, a lot more international trade now, I think, and a lot more complicated technology such that it, we don't know what would happen if international trade was cut off and suddenly people can't get the supplies they need to keep electronics working and, and things like that. Uh, in another sense, we're, we're uh, more robust now because we're quite a lot richer than people were then. So even if our incomes are halved by this kind of disaster, we're probably not going to be starving, or at least unless the food supply is targeted specifically or experiences disruptions. Uh, so in that sense, we're more robust, but at the same time, because our technology is so internationalized uh, and so sophisticated, it's easy to see that we might not be able to keep it running if, if like a lot of nuclear experts die of the disease. Like, how do we keep the nuclear power plants running? Yeah, I think that's absolutely. Those are the the right considerations for sure. Mm. So we, we've talked about uh, the plague and about Spanish flu and smallpox, but there's like other historical analogies and, and some other recent ones that we might want to think about if we're looking at what, what's kind of the distribution of how contagious or how virulent uh, new diseases are. 
So just recently we've had Zika, this uh, which is carried by mosquitoes uh, and usually just produces flu-like symptoms, uh, but also sometimes produces paralysis, we think, uh, in, in a small fraction of cases or temporary, temporary paralysis, and also produces um, deformations in uh, the children of, of pregnant women. Uh, so that's one that we just couldn't control. Uh, I guess it was just too contagious for any of the, or it was already, but before we recognized uh, what was happening, it was already too widespread. I guess we've also got Ebola, which is extremely virulent in that it kills uh, something like half of people who get it, or at least half of people who've gotten it uh, in, in Africa. But it's not that contagious because you have to, it has to be passed through bodily fluids, right? So it's not very good at spreading. Uh, and so the, the recent outbreak was, was by far the worst case. And even then, uh, by improving burial methods, mostly we were able to, to get it back under control. Uh, but it's, it's an example of something that, that we knew about, uh, but in, in fragile states where the healthcare system is very poor, uh, we're, we're not able to prevent every outbreak. Sometimes it does get out of control and then we have a difficult fight on our hands to stop it from spreading. Then there's uh, other, other flu outbreaks. We have the, the swine flu, uh, where there was an effort to try to quarantine it, contain the virus. But again, just our public health systems, uh, at least in, in Mexico and the other countries it got to by the time we realized what was going on, but it's not up to the challenge of containing it. And perhaps the virus was just so contagious that it was never going to be realistic to, to, to cordon it off. Um, then we've got other cases like SARS and, and MERS, uh, these are respiratory syndromes. Uh, SARS, we've managed, we managed to contain in 2003 with only, I think, a couple of hundred fatalities and maybe only a few thousand cases from memory. Um, and that, I think that it, it was in China and Hong Kong and Singapore were the main countries. And I, I think it partly was brought under control just because they were extremely vigilant and actually very good at following up on cases. So they were able to find everyone who'd been exposed. And even though it did seem to spread very well through, uh, through hospitals, they managed to bring it under control. So that's, that's a good case for humanity. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to catch things early enough and be diligent enough. But not every country is quite as organized as Singapore. Uh, are there any others that, that we should think about? Are there other cases that we can learn from recently? So I think you covered um, you know, most of the, the most important ones. Um, and then there are some, some lessons to take away from that. Uh, so one thing that someone might think um, is you know, we have thousands and thousands of years of human history um, and humans have been pretty resilient. And, you know, we haven't had a pandemic that's really, you know, wiped out civilization yet. And so someone might use that as evidence to say, hey, we've come into contact with most of the pathogens out there. Um, and so it seems pretty unlikely that there's some, you know, unknown one that really could cause this type of damage. And I think that some of the new emerging diseases that you mentioned are pretty good evidence that we shouldn't be so sure about that. So, you know, SARS and MERS and um, Zika and HIV AIDS are all examples of you know, diseases that sort of newly emerged, um, as far as we know, over the last, you know, 100 of years, 100 years or even more recently. So they'll give us reason to think that, um, you know, there still are pathogens out there whose effects we don't, we don't really know about yet. Um, so that's one, you know, implication of those, those historical cases. Um, a second one that we've um, seen is, as you mentioned, you know, we have some pretty good cases um, where countries like Singapore and Hong Kong um, have shown how you really can, um, you know, limit the spread of you know, some pretty, pretty serious diseases if you have a really good control system in place. Um, so I think that that's some good news. On the other hand, those weren't, you know, nearly as contagious as something like a particularly contagious flu might be. Um, and then Ebola, um, you know, gives us some evidence of some of the limitations in poorer countries with, um, you know, health systems that really, um, you know, don't have the resources to, to tackle this type of outbreak, how, you know, long it can take to get an outbreak under control, even for a pathogen that um, doesn't spread that quickly, and that would be fairly easy to control in the developed world. Um, so I think that that is a really good warning scenario. Um, 
Ebola, fortunately, doesn't spread that quickly. So it's really not the type of pathogen that could cause a global pandemic um, because once it gets to the developed world, if somebody's really isolated, if a hospital is using all the appropriate procedures and has you know, contemporary top technology, it's much, much less likely for them to pass it on. Um, but we saw how much even that was able to spread in West Africa. Um, and so we have to ask, you know, if it had been a really dangerous, you know, flu instead, you know, how fast would it have spread and how many people would have it, you know, by the time it started spreading outside of the area where it originally started. Um, and if it took us as long as it did to respond to something like Ebola and get it out of control, I think it's a real, it's a real warning shot for what would happen with, with something, you know, even scarier. Yeah. Sometimes when I raise this issue uh, with people who don't know a whole lot about uh, pandemic risks, they say, I, you know, I think that the public health people will have it under control. They'll be able to contain the disease. But we basically know that, that, that that's not the case because we have all of these instances where there were attempts to control a disease and uh, it didn't work out because we just aren't, aren't up to doing that. It's, it's a very difficult task. And, and even in countries that have very good healthcare systems, which isn't everywhere, uh, if you don't catch it early enough or if it's very contagious or if you get unlucky and one person you know, uh, exposes uh, the disease to, to many people, perhaps in a hospital, then it can just get, get out of, spread like wildfire, basically. Yeah, one of the big lessons from you know, the folks who study these types of emerging outbreaks is the importance of early detection. Because a lot of the strategies that we have for response depend on the response happening when not that many people are sick yet. So one of the most effective techniques that we use is called contact tracing, where you go to everybody who's gotten the disease and you track down every single person they've gotten into contact with, um, and you sort of ask all of them to maybe go on preemptive drugs or to isolate themselves until they know that they're not sick. Um, that's viable if you start without that many people who have the disease. Once it's gotten to a certain scale, you just can't imagine having enough public health authorities to do that. So early detection is really key. And something we learned from Ebola is that we don't really have the global systems in place to do that. Um, one thing that we really saw is um, you know, the limitations of you know, even our planning for what to do in the case of a, you know, in the scheme of things, somewhat limited outbreak. Um, a lot of people, I think, assume that the WHO um, you know, is the you know, global authority who ought to be in charge of this type of outbreak. Um, and one thing we definitely learned from Ebola is that they just don't have the resources to do this type of thing. They can provide advice and technical support to the governments in the countries affected, but there's no you know, huge WHO strike team that can just zoom in and mobilize as soon as there's a outbreak. Um, and it really took you know, countries like the United States and the Centers for Disease Control there and the US military to show up um, you know, and voluntarily come and work on, on disease control. And that takes a whole bunch of time to mobilize because there's no you know, default automatic plan for that to happen. Hmm. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, I wanted to ask you, how do you think the, the risks here are affected by things like sloppy research security or by the existence of uh, factory farming, which uh, you know, you know, creates lots of human-animal contact, or people eating wild animals, uh, bushmeat in, in some countries, which then is another route by which diseases can spread from animals, and especially animals that humans haven't been exposed to that much uh, in, into humans. Or perhaps the, the overprescription of antibiotics. Are, are there some like large contributing factors here that maybe we should be targeting? Yeah, so I think that um, all the factors that you mentioned are um, you know are important factors. They all fall under when we think about interventions to reduce these risks. You know, we talk about um, preventing outbreaks, uh, detecting them once they occur, and then responding to them. And those are all sort of in the prevention bucket and sort of preventing you know the initial spread. Um, some of them, I think, are a bigger deal than others. Um, so we talked about how natural pandemics are sort of the bigger risk today, um, but there might be even you know, higher magnitude 
risks down the road if, uh, you know, biological technology really gets, uh, you know, more powerful. Mm -hmm. So today, I think if there's going to be this type of pandemic that really could cause a global catastrophe, um, it's almost certainly going to be from an emerging disease, uh, you know, from a disease that we don't have that much experience with. So it might be a new strain of flu or it might be something that we don't even know much about. Um, and those tend to come from you know, zoonotic areas. So it tends to come from diseases that lived in an animal population for a long time um, and then spreads from animals to humans and turns out to be, you know, really deadly in humans. Um, so a bunch of things that we want to look at there, um, you know, are areas where there's a lot of contact between humans and animals. It's one reason why there's been a lot of focus in the flu community um, on areas of Asia that um, you know, do chicken farming and where there's a lot of contact between birds and humans. So I think that you know, having really sort of safe practices around how animals and humans interact is, you know, is pretty important in that respect. Um, down the road, you know, if we end up in a world where there are bigger risks from biological technology, I think that's where lab safety practices are going to be really important. It's the type of thing that I think is, um, you know, really frustrating to focus a lot on if you're a lab scientist. Um, and every single day, you know, your priority is to make progress on your research. And a lot of the you know, safety measures, I think, feel like um, you know, checking off a box. Um, but, you know, uh, you're not only, you know, risking your own safety. If you get something that's really contagious, you could be risking the, the public safety too. So I think that that's going to be a really important area. And then another really important area is going to be thinking about, um, you know, how to prevent the spread of technologies that could be used, used for ill. Um, and, you know, we can draw an analogy to sort of the nuclear nonproliferation world, where we have a lot of rules about what countries are allowed to you know, have access to nuclear weapons and how many. Um, and we sort of have a somewhat similar regime right now about biological weapons. Um, but most of the rules you know, cover a certain list of pathogens that you're not allowed to take across borders. And that doesn't work anymore if we're in a world where folks can create you know, totally new unconventional organisms that you know, aren't going to be on a list or if they could create something that they don't even know is going to be dangerous, um, or, you know, they might not even be moving an organism from one place to another. Um, you know, if synthetic biology is really successful and you can sort of create a new organism from scratch, um, then, you know, just having the information of the sequence for, you know, some pathogen might be enough to, um, you know, to create something really dangerous. And so I think there has to be a lot of thought put into you know what non-proliferation means and looks like in a world where just you know searching people's bags for like vials that look dangerous in an airport you know really becomes kind of irrelevant. Mm. So during the Cold War, I think the the major powers spent quite a lot of money on these biological warfare programs, trying to come up with pathogens that could be used or. So they, they, they would claim just for the purposes of defending themselves against other people who might develop them. But we've never ended up, up using them. It, it, or as far as I know, they haven't really been used in, in a war. Is it just that they're, they're not really practical to use? Because they'll come back and, and, and bite you in the ass, right? <laughs> if, if these things spread, then they're going to end up infecting your own soldiers. Yeah, so I think that there are you know, a few um, reasons why they haven't been used. Uh, you know, they've almost never been used so far. Um, so one thing that's important to clarify is that, um, my impression at least is that when countries were researching biological weapons, which is now banned by the Biological Weapons Convention, um, but, you know, previously wasn't, and we've learned that even after it had been banned, uh, the USSR had a major biological weapons research program for a long time in secret, um, but the weapons that they were mostly working on weren't the type of things that could cause the type of catastrophe that we're talking about. Um, it's localized. Yeah. So the sort of most common things that are talked about as biological weapons threats are things like anthrax, which we have seen examples of being used. Um, but fortunately, it's the type of thing 
Um, that's in some ways a little bit more similar to a conventional weapon in that once someone is harmed by it, it can't spread. So you can imagine a really terrible tragedy that occurs because of the use of anthrax, um, but it's, you know, really hard to imagine something that's globalized and really has an effect on the long run future um, because, you know, somebody who gets anthrax can't then spread it on to the next person. So it's more um, like chemical warfare in that yes, respect. Yes, it's more similar to chemical warfare in that respect. Um, and the things that we might be, you know, a little bit more worried about are, you know, the use of something like smallpox or the flu, um, where you could, you know, infect, uh, you know, your enemies, you know, soldiers or civilians, um, and then they would pass it on, and, you know, you really could see a, a global impact. And, you know, as you pointed out, a, there are several reasons why no country has done that so far. Um, one of the main ones is that there's no way to stop it from then, you know, coming back and infecting um, you know, your, your own side. And so there are some really strong incentives for people not to use that type of weapon. It's a little hard to even imagine, um, you know, the person for whom it would be a rational decision, what types of goals you could have that would make it make sense. Um, I guess North Korea using it for blackmail or something like that. Yeah, so I think that that's one example. Um, we do have, you know, a few examples over history of suicide cults um, who just had a worldview, um, you know, where they just uh, you know, thought it would be good to, to kill as many people as possible. Um, Aum Shinriko in Japan uh, in the 90s was one example um, that actually did try to have a biological weapons program. They weren't successful, but that's sort of another example of the, the type of ideology that could lead you to do this thing. Um, and so far, we've been fortunate in that the technology to weaponize diseases has been difficult enough to work with that you've really needed to be sort of at the scale of a country government to, to use it successfully. And it's pretty hard to imagine getting enough people to sort of buy into this idea to want to do something like that. Um, the danger is that down the road, if it becomes possible for, you know, a few individuals um, and, you know, maybe not even uh, individuals with, you know, a PhD in biology, but people with you know, some amount of background are, you know, also able to sort of work with these types of pathogens. Um, you know, that's where we might become a lot more concerned. So let's turn now to thinking about um, what's, what's already being done. We, we touched on this a bit earlier, but when a pandemic starts, who exactly is responding and, and, and what are they doing to try to, to try to control it? Yeah, so something to start with is, um, so once a pandemic starts, there's sort of two phases. One of them is the detection phase. And the next one is the response phase. Um, and so at the detection phase, um, where the you know, relevant authorities are first trying to you know, figure out if an outbreak actually exists and then figure out you know, what sort of outbreak is this, how serious is it, what type of measures do we need to take to put it in place. Um, you know, that's mostly going to be done um, depending on where exactly it occurs by, you know, local individual doctors and hospitals, um, and then country governments, and then possibly, you know, nonprofits and NGOs. Um, and so it's important to, to point out that um, nobody knows when a pandemic starts. So a pandemic is a outbreak that eventually becomes, you know, global and is a certain level of severity. Um, and so when you first notice, you know, the first time that someone shows up to a hospital sick with a something that will become a pandemic, um, you know, nobody has any way to know that it's that severe. They'll likely show up to a hospital and they'll have, you know, flu-like symptoms or, or something like that. Um, and, you know, there's a question of how long it will take before anybody notices that something unusual will happen. Um, and so, you know, the, the term of art for that process of sort of noticing that something unusual has happened that requires a response is called disease surveillance. Um, and that works you know, differently in different countries. 
Um, but the general idea is that there are a few ways that a uh, potential pandemic might be detected. Uh, you know, one of them might be with, you know, real sort of formal diagnostics. Um, so, you know, somebody might come to a hospital and, you know, if they have a bowl of symptoms and it's, you know, pretty far into, um, you know, the, the progression of the disease, um, you know, uh, diseases like Ebola look, you know, pretty similar to each other. Um, and so it's at least possible that a doctor will notice. Hemorrhagic fevers, yes. that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a set of hemorrhagic fevers. Um, you know, they all look pretty similar to each other, but at least far enough into the disease look reasonably distinct from other diseases. So especially if you're in an area where people, where doctors have seen Ebola cases before, doctor might notice. Then there are specific diagnostic tests um, you know, for detecting whether or not somebody has Ebola. So a doctor will have to, might either already have those diagnostics or might have to get the diagnostics. Um, and you might get tested. And, you know, if there is an Ebola case somewhere, um, there's at least supposed to be a reporting system where the doctor will probably report it to the Ministry of Health, who then is supposed to report it to the WHO. And then there's sort of, you know, some type of global knowledge of the fact that there's been an outbreak of a disease that could potentially cause a public health emergency. Um, the, you know, that's sort of a, in some ways, I mean, it's a tragedy, but it's also in some ways the best case scenario because it's a disease that looks reasonably distinct. Um, the more likely scenario and the sort of scarier scenario is that, you know, somebody gets a really dangerous disease, but that, you know, it looks like a disease that is endemic to the area, you know, a disease that people get in the area sort of every day. Um, it looks like malaria. Exactly. So that's a really good example is that, you know, one of the main, uh, you know, symptoms that someone who, um, you know, has a really dangerous flu might have is a high fever. That could also be malaria. It could be measles. If somebody shows up to a hospital with a high fever, um, you know, it's not at all clear that anybody would know what the person has. They might just assume that it's, you know, one of the many people who has something like, like malaria. And they might not even test. They're not going to be asking the question because you can't test everyone who comes in with a high fever for everything that they might have. Exactly. Um, and so one limitation, a major limitation of most of the diagnostics that are currently in use is that we don't have very successful broad spectrum diagnostics, which means diagnostics where you can take one sample from somebody and, you know, just ask, what is this person infected with? And instead, the way that most diagnostics work is you get diagnosed for a specific pathogen. So the doctor essentially has to take an educated guess at what the patient might have um, and gets a yes or no answer, which means that if somebody shows up and the only symptom is like a, a fever um, and the doctor isn't yet aware that there's some outbreak taking place, um, it's really tough for anybody to sort of diagnose that there's anything out of the ordinary going on. And it might not become apparent until at a certain point, um, you know, in a certain location, there are many, many more people coming to the hospital than usual. And, you know, that might be the first time that anybody realizes, oh, this isn't our normal level of, you know, background disease, but something, you know, really out of the ordinary is happening. Mm. So they're going to have to test them for the first thing they think they have, and then the second thing, and then the third thing, and then they might give up, and maybe they've gotten better or died by that point. So exactly, and because that's how the system works, um, for a lot of diseases, people won't get a diagnostic at all. Um, and so, you know, if uh, you're in an area where you know, malaria is pretty prevalent and someone shows up with, uh, you know, a fever and malaria-like symptoms, often the, you know, best practice is just to give the person malaria drugs and send them home. Um, and they, you know, don't even bother to get the diagnostics in the first place. Um, so, you know, in that type of case, um, it really takes a noticeable number of people infected before anybody would, would realize that something's amiss. Um, so 
you mentioned that the World Health Organization ultimately gets notified, but like, what, what do they what do they do? Are you saying they don't they didn't have that many they don't have that many resources to to act? Do they just tell other governments that there's a problem? Yeah. So there are um, you know two uh, really important issues there. One of them is that there's a you know set of guidelines called the international health regulations that govern what countries are supposed to do when they learn that there's been an outbreak of the type of disease that could cause international concern. Um, so it doesn't even necessarily have to be something that could rise to the level of a pandemic, but the type of thing that countries around them ought to know about. Um, and, you know, one aspect of that is that they're supposed to have, you know, enough surveillance systems in place and response systems in place that they are likely to notice if this happens. Now, the second aspect is that they are required to report it to the WHO. Um, very few countries are actually in full compliance with the international health regulations um, for a bunch of reasons, but one of the main ones is that it's just really expensive and really hard to get all the way up to there. Um, if you're a country that you know, might not have a lot of resources and might have, you know, on a day-to-day -day level, might have a lot higher mortality rates from, you know, the types of diseases that are endemic that people are getting all the time, but that aren't likely to spread abroad. Um, so, you know, they might be more concerned with, with those types of, those types of issues. Um, so countries often aren't in compliance with the IHRs and so might not notice. Um, and then even if they do notice, um, a lot of countries really resist telling the WHO about the problem. Um, there's a lot of concern that sort of knowledge of an outbreak will lead to things like you know, stigmatization of people from that country or you know, boycotts and you know, immigration barriers in that country really being you know, closed off and taking a big economic hit. Um, and so you know, that's, a, that's a second major issue is that even once countries um, you know, discover that there's an outbreak, um, giving them the right incentives so that they actually report it. You know, is a, is a tough problem. And then if they do report it to the WHO, you know, as, as we talked about, um, you know, we would like to live in a world where the WHO then has a lot of resources to deal with it. Um, that's not really the world that we live in. So they do have um, a outbreak alert and response team. Um, it has very, very few people. Um, there are a bunch of proposals on the table um, especially sort of as a response to Ebola to, you know, really beef that up. But, um, you know, so far that, that hasn't happened. Um, so what the WHO does is, you know, make it public that this is happening. Um, they'll provide, you know, some types of like advice and technical support to the Ministry of Health in the country that's affected. Um, and they might serve sort of a coordinating role as they try to get, um, you know, other countries to sort of cooperate in addressing the outbreak. So if the outbreak is happening in a rich country, then you might see the rich country mostly dealing with it on its own. Um, if the outbreak is happening in a poorer country or a country with, you know, a less well-developed outbreak response system, um, then you're probably going to need you know, doctors from outside of that country and epidemiologists to come in and provide assistance um, and the WHO might be able to coordinate that, but that's going to be sort of each donor country's individual decision about whether or not they want to provide assistance and what type of assistance they want to, to provide. And there's no sort of automatic system for that to happen immediately. And what ends up usually happening because of that is that the first responders are sometimes organizations like, you know, Doctors Without Borders is a really good example. So NGOs that you know, already have doctors that are sort of experts in the country um, just sort of showing up and doing whatever they can do. And they're often experts in crisis response, um, but, you know, aren't in any formal way able to bring in the types of resources that, like, a large country government could, could bring in instead. And so you would like in an ideal world to have this sort of 
coordinated global, you know, system where it's very clear who's responsible for making a plan, who's responsible for providing resources, who's responsible for scaling up resources if it's needed to be. But instead, you have a much more sort of fractured ad hoc system where, you know, the country that's affected will have their Ministry of Health doing what they can do. And then you might have some nonprofits, you know, each doing what they can do, but like without any already built in communication and coordination system. Um, and then eventually you might have donor governments and philanthropists sort of coming in as well. So there's a lot of problems here. It sounds yes. like. So even when the WHO is alerted, hopefully ultimately they're alerted to the fact that there's a news disease spreading. There's no group of people to swoop in and solve the problem. They've got only a handful of people that they can afford to pay to, try, right. to go in and try to intervene if this is happening in a country without a great health system. And so they have to wait for richer donor countries to pony up some money, which could take weeks or months. And also because there's no way of f fairly distributing the costs among those countries, I imagine they're inclined to kind of wait and hope that another country will pony up the money so then, then, then they, they don't have to spend it themselves. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And by the time you get to the stage where they've got the money, they've convinced the donor countries to give, and now they're starting to coordinate it, it could just be all too late. Yeah, so I think that those are, you know, at, there's sort of all of these stages of response. And at each stage, I think you'll find sort of major obstacles and you, you identified several. Um, so sort of the next obstacle that often comes along in this realm of like WHO coordination um, is that once you, um, you know, do start to have a response, one of the first things that you want to do is if it's an emerging disease um, that, you know, doesn't have necessarily like a highly effective vaccine yet, um, then you immediately want to get a sample of the pathogen, sequence it, and get people working on treatments and vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of issues there where we don't have a very good system established for how to share all of the data that you know, is collected as part of this. Um, so, you know, who owns the data when the when it's eventually sequenced? Um, you know, if a vaccine is created, you know, who owns that vaccine? Um, and so often those types of things are being worked out on the fly. Um, and you have all these sort of like international negotiations that are happening in the midst of a crisis. Right. So charities are, are pitching in here. It seems a bit crazy that the planet relies on private charities to, to do this kind of disease control. But there's some charities that do that. Are they potentially a good group to get involved with? Um, yeah, so um, I will, you know, first caveat this by saying it's a really big uh, field pit of awareness, and I am definitely not an expert in every area. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an area where I, I wish I was more expert than I am. Um, I think that... A lot of the organizations that sort of do this rapid response are um, incredibly valuable. And I have just sort of, um, you know, don't know about their work firsthand, but I've talked to a lot of people about um, the great work that a bunch of these organizations do, especially um, Doctors Without Borders in particular. Mm -hmm. um, that said, as you pointed out, um, you know, I think that the eventual system that we want to land on um, is not, you know, whatever doctors happen to be there sort of holding the fort until the real response happens. Um, and so, you know, because in the long run, I think we really want, you know, some type of more coordinated planned out system. Um, and because, you know, to the extent that we don't have that system, um, I think in a worst case scenario, it really might be, um, you know, just too little that those types of doctors can do. Um, and so my instinct is that that's not sort of the, the first place that I would, you know, work on if I wanted to really reduce risks from pandemics. Um, I do think it might be an incredible, uh, you know, learning opportunity, an opportunity to, you know, really get to know the field. And I think it's hard to advocate for policy change um, in areas that you haven't seen up close. Um, but in the long run, I think the type of change that we need to see, and I think organizations like Doctors Without Borders um, are often the first ones to say this, is that 
they will do, they will be the Band-Aid, but they are very vocal about the fact that they do not think that they ought to be the ones who are the Band-Aid. Yeah. And so I think the things that would be in the long run more effective are things like pushing for the WHO to have the resources to do this kind of thing, or if it can't be the WHO, um, you know, pushing for the creation of a new international organization to do it, or, you know, if not that, um, you know, pushing for, you know, rich country governments to, you know, provide this type of response. Um, and then, you know, finding sort of more leveraged points. So, you know, it might be that instead of focusing on the response after the outbreak has already happened, um, you know, to focus on ways to, like, detect outbreaks sooner um, or focus on, you know, ways to uh, prevent them from starting in the first place. Mm -hmm. The other thing about that type of work um, that might make it a little bit less um, sort of neglected than some other areas is that the type of, you know, immediate response by NGO doctors on the ground that you see happen for a potential pandemic, um, I think is going to be the same type of person that you see responding to, you know, more frequent outbreaks. Um, and so um, that means that there's a little bit more attention to that problem than the problem of like, um, you know, how someone would respond specifically to the types of scenarios that we don't see that often, but that could be something like another Spanish flu. To, to the big one. Yeah. Hmm. So we'll come back to what kind of reforms we want to see in a minute, but uh, how long would it take to start making a vaccine for a new disease uh, if, if we could develop one at all? What, are we talking weeks or months or years? Um, so... It, um, I think that the best answer is that we're not totally sure. Um, it depends a lot on the specific pathogen. Um, it depends on our standards for how good the disease, ha uh, for how good the vaccine has to be. Um, it depends on, you know, the regulations in place in the specific country. Um, and it depends on, you know, how much of a priority the global community puts on making the vaccine, but sort of uh, uh, to get a sense, um, you know, one uh, extreme is that you know, people have been trying really hard to make a vaccine for HIV AIDS um, for decades and still have not been able to develop one. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a virus that for, for various reasons is particularly difficult to make a vaccine for. Um, Cause it's constantly evolving. Right? Yeah. It mutates a lot. Um, so, you know, that's an example where you could have decades of effort and still not have a vaccine. Um, often, you know, every year, um, for the seasonal flu, um, doctors, uh, you know, develop a new vaccine, um, that, you know, lots of people in the developed world get every year. Um, they have to guess sort of far in advance what strains of flu are going to be the next seasonal flu um, because it takes months to you know, develop the vaccine and then manufacture enough of them to, to have it at scale. Um, so I think we're really, um, in the most likely scenarios, talking about you know, a few months to develop a vaccine that works um, and a few months to then manufacture enough of it. Um, and then, you know, you have lots of questions about like, how much do you want to test it out if it's really new before you use it at scale and, and all of those types of things. Um, but if, even if, if people are falling dead in the streets, we might want to sc scrimp on the safety testing. Um, so <laughs> it's just not safe not to release it. Well, so that's, I think a really difficult question. And I think in a real worst case scenario, like ideally you would want to do that, but you have a lot of risks, especially in places where people don't trust the government that much. Um, where if you have a few cases where somebody is harmed by the vaccine, you could really see people stop trusting the public health authorities. And then and even big... if they produce a safer vaccine yeah, later. Exactly. So that's a big risk. Um, you also have a problem where, um, you know, ideally you want the vaccine to be rolled out in a way where you're tracking results. So you can also be learning over time about, um, you know, about the effectiveness of the vaccine. But there, um, you know, are all kinds of issues with the regulations and the ethics around around doing that. Um, and then, even if there's consensus around 
um, you know, maybe reducing the amount of safety testing because, uh, you know, pathogen just is that uh, dangerous. Um, you still need to have a legal process to make that happen. And often, you know, the, the regulations just, just aren't there if a country hasn't you know, thought in advance about what would we do in this type of crisis. So I think one thing that's really important is every country ought to have a plan for what they would do if this were to happen. And a lot of countries aren't there yet. I'm sure that we can trust Congress to make scientifically grounded decisions on the fly about these difficult public policy Yeah, they have issues. a pretty good uh, track record on that Pretty good right. track record. Um, so something that actually was um, really disillusioning for me um, was Congress's uh, lack of response to the Zika virus. Um, and, you know, it was coming sort of just on the tail of Ebola. So at a time where there really was a lot of public attention on dangers from outbreaks, um, and it was, you know, months and months where the CDC was sort of begging for more funding to, uh, you know, work on learning about Zika, um, you know, preventing it from spreading in the United States. And Congress uh, basically kept asking, why can't you take the money that we already allocated for like Ebola follow up and use that on Zika instead? So I think that that was a sign that we shouldn't be too confident that lawmakers will be you know, able to handle this type of thing on the fly. On the other hand... Um, you know, Zika is not a particularly deadly disease and you might see more of a sort of, um, you know, attitude of like crisis management if we really had, um, you know, something a lot more dangerous. So it sounds like in very poor countries, the uh, response is going to be very unsatisfactory and that the international coordination mechanisms are also really not up to the task. But what about the government in the U.S. overall? Do you think it's doing a reasonable amount to protect us from, from these kind of threats? And I know we have the, the Centers for Disease Control. Yeah, so um, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Um, so the um, United States spends a really large proportion of the global you know, resources going into these types of issues. Um, and I think that that's you know, really impressive and really important. Um, and, you know, the United States has a relatively successful public health system, um, for certain types of diseases, something like Ebola, um, you know, there's much less chance of spread in a U.S. hospital, um, which has, you know, even basic things like personal protective equipment, like the gloves and masks that, um, you know, nurses and doctors are supposed to be um, using can run out in, in poorer countries. And so there are, you know, a lot of advantages in the U.S. Um, that said, um, I think that there still are, even in wealthy countries like the United States, um, a whole bunch of gaps in the systems that we have in place. Um, and so, you know, some of them are gaps in the, you know, resources that we dedicate to this type of thing. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really important to see the U.S. government dedicate more resources to fighting, to providing assistance to countries with fewer resources so that they detect outbreaks earlier, which I think would also be helpful for countries like the United States, um, cause you know, diseases really don't respect borders and can, can spread quickly. Um, another issue is that it's just a really difficult problem to make, you know, all of the local healthcare providers around the country know how to respond to, you know, some disease they've never treated before. Mm. Um, and you saw that in the Ebola context, where there really was a lot of panic by local healthcare providers who didn't necessarily know, um, you know, what type of personal protective equipment do I have to use so that as a nurse, I don't get sick? Like how much, like which people do I have to isolate? All those types of things. Um, and there was sort of a, a difficulty in, in responding in a crisis. Um, another big problem is that um, even though the U.S. does have the CDC, um, there's a lot of ambiguity still over, in the case of a really se severe outbreak, who exactly is in charge. Um, and so there's the CDC, but there's um, you know, other parts of health and human services. Um, there's the White House, which in the case of Ebola, set up a special White House Ebola czar. Um, you know, there's, um, if there were any risk that something might be an intentional release of a biological weapon, then you'd have law enforcement involved. There's like state and local 
actors. Um, there's the NIH that heads up a lot of the sort of research. Um, but there's also parts of the health and human services, um, other parts of health and human services like BARDA that also are sort of working on research. And so um, there's a lot of different people, all of whom are in charge of like a chunk of the response and no person who's like the one person who's totally account accountable. Um, and so I think the best place right now to go if you want to see sort of a list of the many ways in which the U.S. government could improve its responses is really the uh, report that Open Philanthropy um, you know, funded that was made by the Blue Ribbon Project on uh, Panel on Biodefense. And they um, you know, were able to identify a lot of gaps where U.S. policy could really improve. Hmm. And you haven't even mentioned the military yet, who presumably yeah. could get involved, especially if there was a need to move people overseas to areas where a disease was spreading. I know that they, they ultimately had to get involved in the Ebola case because no one else would fly there or no one else had the capacity to bring in the people and equipment, right? Exactly. And the military also has um, is the one sort of agency that's focused the most on defense against biological weapons. So if the pathogen that was getting passed around was the type of pathogen that people had worried might be used as a biological weapon. Often, a lot of the experts will actually be at the Department of Defense. Mm. They also just have much more logistics capacity. Um, so if you need to do something like set up tons of mobile hospitals, they're the ones who are sort of able to do that. And there's often some tension between the, the health side and the, the defense side. And I think there could really be sort of more of a process for facilitating you know, communication across those cultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that that coordination role um, is really a gap. And then something else I'll add that's a particular gap in places like the United States um, is because of just how the political system works, um, I think that there's a temptation to always be sort of preparing for a crisis that looks exactly like the most recent one um, instead of thinking towards the future. And Part of that's like a natural human tendency. Um, and part of that is because um, of, you know, just sort of the incentives facing politicians where, um, you know, if they are putting a lot of, if, you know, health and human services is putting a lot of research and resources into, um, you know, researching a vaccine for a pathogen that would be really awful if it spread, but, you know, it's very unlikely to spread. Um, every year that Congress asks, you know, what were our results? How many lives did this save? You know, the answer until the one time yeah. where it really matters, the answer is going to be, you know, it, it didn't help. And so there's a lot of pressure on them to sort of show results, mm -hmm. which means working on the sort of more frequent, um, you know, epidemics, but the ones that might not be as severe. So I think that there's a real need for, um, you know, just to in any way possible sort of subsidize or, you know, advocate for work that, uh, you know, would specifically address the types of things that would be real worst case scenarios. Hmm. So I've, I've read some books about this general topic lately, and I'll, I'll stick some uh, links up to them in the, in the notes on the episode. Uh, it's a particularly good one by Laurie Garrett about the uh, Ebola yeah. uh, outbreak uh, and how we responded and, and the, the ways in which it was uh, really, really not sufficient. So let's focus now on what it, what can be done to make pandemics less of a threat to humanity. We've already touched on this a bit, but uh, what kinds of people do you know working in the area and, and what are they doing, uh, even ones you haven't, uh, Open Phil hasn't made grants to? Yeah, so there are um, a whole set of areas that I think are really important. And um, one way to um, organize them, which I've referred to a few times, is sort of prevention, detection, and response. And so I can talk about some things that strike me as really important in each of those areas. Um, so in the prevention area, um, there is, you know, preventing the occurrence of an outbreak of a natural disease. Um, and I think that that's pretty tough. Um, but there's some really interesting work there, um, particularly on um, trying to surveil animal populations. So learn about, you know, what diseases are already floating around among animals and whether or not any of them are reasonably close to the type of disease that could cause potentially a really severe pandemic among humans. Um, I think that that's sort of really important. And if you know the answer to that, 
then you can also take steps for prevention, like, um, you know, like uh, focusing particularly on limiting contact with animals in certain populations, or if you have to cull certain populations of animals, um, if you want to like prioritize, uh, you know, preparing by stockpiling certain vaccines, all those types of things, um, you know, require you to do that type of preparedness in advance. So that's, you know, one area. And a lot of people, um, you know, are sort of working on, on that type of thing. Um, and then I think maybe an even more neglected area of um, prevention that um, I think also is neglected because it's focused in particular on things that aren't a risk today, but that we might, might need to plan for down the road. Um, is thinking about how policy might have to change if biotechnology really advances really quickly and what we could do to prevent an outbreak in that world. Um, so there are things in that area, like thinking about what type of regulations we would want to have on the use of desktop um, synthesizers if it became possible to sort of synthesize a virus from scratch. Um, or today, we have a lot of DNA synthesis companies that are companies that you can basically call up and say, um, you know, here's a sequence. I want you to synthesize some DNA with this sequence, and you can order it. There are still technological limitations to, like, how complicated of a um, organism you can order. And those firms are supposed to screen um, this sort of an agreement to screen the DNA before they send it to you to make sure that you're not ordering anything unsafe. Um, you, there's don't, not, you don't want people ordering smallpox. Exactly. There's not yet a ton of information about you know, how accurate those screening processes are. Do we know if all the firms are using them? And especially, there's more information about firms in the United States than there is abroad. But as biotechnology becomes, you know, uh, accessible to more and more countries, which is a good thing. It lets them have, you know, really important medical industries. Um, you know, we really want some types of international agreements on, you know, what does screening for this type of look like? Are you only screening for known threats? Or are you going to, like, try to identify certain characteristics that might not occur in any natural pathogens, but that could make a pathogen, you know, really dangerous? Um, if you do that, like, do you want that information out there about, you know, what types of sequences you're banned from synthesizing? Maybe not if that is, you know, creating a recipe for... So there are a lot of like, really also, difficult policy questions. It would also allow people to evade it if they yeah. knew what the, what the rules were. They exactly. could just do the thing that didn't quite trigger the, the alarm. Um, and I think that there's, uh, you know, consensus among most people in the field that these are, you know, difficult, important questions... There's also a consensus that we don't want to panic because the technology isn't there yet. But I think something that would be really scary is if we first start to address these types of policy issues after the technology has already developed. Um, and there have been you know, some people doing really good work on this type of stuff. Um, the um, Vetner Institute um, put out maybe five or six years ago, a really good piece on the governance of synthetic biology that talked about these types of screening technology. Um, you know, but that, you know, it was five years ago. Technology moves really fast. I think yeah. we'd really love to see, um, you know, updates on, on that kind of thing. So there's, you know, in this area, there's diplomacy that needs to be done and getting countries to sort of agree on international standards. There's science that needs to be done and computer science and like, how do you set up these, these screening technologies? Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work there and, you know, thinking about what does non-proliferation look like in this area. And then similarly, so that's all sort of dressing, um, who gets to use this technology and, um, you know, how do we enforce that? There are also questions about, um, you know, safety and what types of requirements do we want to have on labs or on individuals who are working with dangerous pathogens, um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for research there on both, um, you know, are there better safety techniques that um, you know, could be used? Are there ways to, you know, specifically engineer an organism so it couldn't survive in the wild if you're working for some with something that's dangerous? Um, so there's a lot of science there. Um, there's a lot of sort of engineering questions about 
if people are working with dangerous uh, pathogens, how do we make sure that they don't get infected? Um, and there are sort of legal questions about how much that ought to be required. Um, and similarly, something that I would love to see people work on is also figuring out if there are requirements, sort of safety requirements that we are requiring of scientists today that actually aren't that useful. Because I know a lot of scientists find these types of requirements really onerous. Um, and so on the one hand, we really want to eliminate the chance of any sort of accidents. On the other hand, we want to make it as easy as possible for scientists to comply. Um, and so, you know, we really want to make sure that we are not, um, that we're, you know, only asking for things that are valuable so we can really build a, a safety, a culture of safety among scientists who, who work with dangerous pathogens. So it sounds like there's a, there's a lot of things there, a lot of different opportunities, uh, cause there's so many different, well, so many different angles on the problem, uh, preventing it, uh, you're detecting it early, responding, yeah, it seems like there's dozens of potential. I think that there's a lot of work to do, a lot of work for people from different fields. Um, something else that I just ought to mention is I think that there's a lot of really important social science to be done too. Um, you know, we've talked about how the problem of non-proliferation becomes you know much more difficult, and maybe in some ways almost impossible if you don't even need to bring an actual physical organism from one place to another. If we end up in a world where um, you know, progress is faster than expected and you can just have a desktop synthesizer and create a new organism, um, there's not much of a way to screen for that. And so what you're really going to need there is ways to think about um, you know, how do you build a culture of security so that people are less likely to misuse this technology? Are there things that you can do to get the like DIY bio community to really look out for each other and sort of notice if you know, somebody's doing something unsafe or doesn't have good security practices and figuring out you know, what motivates people to actually like really focus on safety and security, which can feel like a chore, um, I think is a really important problem. Uh, Megan Palmer is a scient social scientist and a uh, biologist at um, Stanford who's working on these types of issues. But I think that there aren't sort of nearly enough people, people working on this type of thing. Right. When you described the desktop synthesizer and just making all the bio biology a matter of information that you can spread over the internet, uh, that sounds pretty concerning to me. Uh, are there things that we ought to be banning or technologies that we should be trying not to develop because we're just better off not having them? So... Um, I think that's a really difficult question. Um, I think something that's really important is that the technologies sound scary because they are so powerful, um, you know, which means that they also can have really enormous benefits. Um, and so you know, one big challenge right now that we would have if we were responding to a really novel pathogen is that we wouldn't expect you know, any hospital to have, uh, you know, stockpiles of vaccines or diagnostics. Um, in a world where you had, like, biological 3D printers, um, you know, you wouldn't have to, like, have this huge stockpile. You know, you could literally, um, you know, develop a vaccine, uh, you know, email the information to a hospital and have it them printed out on, a, on the spot. So it's... It's certainly possible that there are technologies that we shouldn't develop. I am both sort of really wary of doing that type of stuff. I think a lot of the biggest gains that um, society has ever seen come from, you know, bioscience. Um, and I'm also a little bit skeptical of the possibility. Um, I think for most really powerful technologies, like someone somewhere is going to develop it. And if you push it underground, there are risks there too. So for the really broadly useful technologies, like advances in um, synthesis, like it's hard for me to imagine a world where, uh, you know, banning that type of thing is both useful and successful. Um, there are types of science that are, you know, specifically sort of at the most dangerous end um, and where there has been more dialogue about whether there should be restrictions. Um, the best example there is those experiments we talked about earlier where um, it's called gain of function research, where you take a virus and modify it to make it more dangerous. 
Um, and there's been a real debate in Washington, both about whether or not you know, scientists ought to have to get approval from the government to do that type of work, um, and you know, whether it ought to happen at all, whether they ought to have to show big enough benefits before they do that type of work. Um, I think that's a, a really important debate, also on whether or not the results of that type of work ought to be, uh, ought to be public. And so that strikes me as a really important debate. And I think that at least for um, gain-of-function research that creates potentially pandemic pathogens, um, you know, there's, there ought to be a pretty high barrier for, you know, how much of a chance of a benefit you have to show for the research, um, you know, before people, people work with something that risky. Hmm. So uh, what kind of reforms are needed at the international level? We discussed some earlier, but are there other changes that you'd like to see? Um, so I definitely can't be comprehensive there because I think the answer is that there are a lot of things that could be improved. Um, so one big one, um, as we talked about, um, is having some type of coordination around response. Um, and you know, whether it be the WHO or some other organization, um, you'd like to see to have a system so that if there's an outbreak, everybody knows who's responsible and has the resources automatically in place. I think that's one really important goal. Um, a second one is you probably do need some international coordination on research and development into the types of what we call medical countermeasures, um, which are diagnostics and treatments and vaccines that would be useful in these sort of uh, you know low probability, high impact scenarios. Um, because these scenarios are both low probability um, and could happen anywhere and would affect the whole globe, um, there's sort of an under incentive for any individual country to put in the research to work on them. And so I think some type of additional coordination on researching those in advance would be incredibly useful. And you can imagine, you know, treaties or like, uh, you know, institutions that different countries contribute to that are doing that type of research. Um, you really want some type of non-proliferation regime and agreements on, you know, what types of, um, you know, pathogens or technology are dangerous enough that there should be restrictions about who gets to use them and who gets to export them and, and that type of thing. Um, you'd like to see a lot more just resources going from rich countries um, to all different aspects of this problem. Um, and then a sort of area that I think is really important is to just have people, um, you know, even do just sort of like really pie in the sky theoretical research on the question of like, um, if we had a sort of worst case scenario, um, what t parts of the system um, that we currently have in place to address epidemics in general would do a bad job of handling that type of scenario. Um, so, you know, the types of things that could really lead to a big global catastrophe, you know, might be something that's infectious for a really long time before somebody starts getting symptoms, which slows down the response and means that, um, you know, by the time there's a response, the initial infected person could have spread the disease really far. Um, something that I'd be really interested in seeing people work on is asking, are there ways to catch that type of outbreak in advance? Because that's the type of thing that's really neglected because it will only be applicable in these types of scenarios. But those are the scenarios we've got to be most worried about. So that's the incubation period, right? Yeah. And I guess HIV is a great example of this. Yes. Where it, HIV is actually extremely non-contagious in a way. It's, it's actually not easy to transmit at all. But the the incubation period is so long and the person survives for so long that there's many opportunities for them to pass it from one person to another. Yep, that's which right. Which has made it like spread reasonably well. Yeah, so I think thinking of um, creative ways to um, you know, notice outbreaks like that much earlier than we do now um, is really important. Um, you can think about uh, similar issues on the um, diagnostics and vaccine side. So... If we're talking about the types of diseases that people get frequently on a day-to-day -day basis that are, uh, you know, endemic to a particular area, um, the current diagnostic system where you take a guess at what the person probably has and just test for it 
uh, it works reasonably well. Um, but we're not most likely to get a global catastrophe from the types of things that we've seen before. If we really have a global catastrophe, it'll probably be from the type of pathogen that we haven't faced before. Um, and so thinking about broad-based diagnostics that would be able to give us information even about pathogens that are novel um, or platforms for manufacturing or developing uh, vaccines really quickly based just on the sequence of a pathogen that we didn't know much about before. Um, those are areas that are really important from the perspective of somebody who cares a ton about minimizing the risk of a global catastrophe that might be neglected by people um, you know, whose job is really to protect uh, you know, a specific country from the risks that are most likely over the next few years. These international reforms, I guess, could be pursued in departments of foreign affairs or the State Department or potentially the military to some extent, or, or you could try to become a, an elected politician or, or go into international bodies like the World Health Organization, the OECD, perhaps, uh, the United Nations, the, the relevant bodies in there, the relevant agencies. Which governments do you think matter the most? Obviously, the United States is a big player. I guess China is also uh, an important one, though probably not many listeners are able to get into the Chinese government. Uh, but if you can, maybe th think about that. I guess there's also the UK. Uh, any others that we should be thinking about? Um, so yeah, so I think you hit some of the major ones. The United States puts a lot of resources into the issue. So there's a lot of leverage from working there. Um, countries with emerging biotechnology industries might be really important. So China's a really good example there. Um, you know, India is another good example there. Um, and then uh, I think it's also worth emphasizing that, uh, you know, government isn't the only place to do this type of work. So I often compare the sort of nuclear security industry to the biological security industry. And in the nuclear area, we have a lot of advocacy organizations. Um, Plowshares and the Nuclear Threat Initiative are you know, two out of many examples. Um, and you don't have as much of an advocacy sector um, in the biological threat pandemic area. Um, and so I think, you know, being at a nonprofit that was able to really push governments and put up a fuss when government neglected these issues, I think would be really important. And then for a lot of these issues, um, I think we don't even know what the right policy is yet. Um, and so sort of think tank and academic policy research, just sort of trying to figure out, uh, you know, what the costs and benefits would be of different, um, you know, of different regulatory approaches um, and of different coordination mechanisms and talking to a lot of doctors and scientists to figure out, you know, what would be the most beneficial arrangements that would have you know, the least onerous impacts on the scientists and doctors who are doing their jobs, I think would also be incredibly, incredibly valuable. Okay. So what kind of improvements to security protocols are needed in, in your view? Um, so I mentioned a few of them, but I think that um, you know, one of the main ones is, you know, thinking about this area of non-proliferation and as it becomes more and more possible to modify organisms, um, you know, realizing that the approach where there's a specific list of pathogens that you can't export is no longer going to work. And so really, uh, you know, over time adopting those types of agreements, I think is really important from a security perspective. Um, a second one is um, finding ways to uh, both detect, you know, any type of use of biological weapons as quickly as possible um, and also have law enforcement, um, you know, really trained on how to, how to deal with these issues. I think both of those are, um, you know, incredibly important. The United States has some programs. Um, aimed at detection, um, where they'll have like, you know, sensors in the environment that are supposed to pick up uh, pathogens in the atmosphere. Um, most people are not very optimistic about um, you know, how much of a success that's been so far. Um, I think that that type of thing is, is incredibly important. Um, I think also there have been a bunch of, um, you know, sort of policy simulations 
um, done where they sort of did like tabletop scenario testing with politicians to see how they would respond in the case of the use of biological weapons. Um, And I think one of the um, lessons from that is that there isn't really a ton of knowledge about what the process would be, um, how it would look different uh, from the response to a natural outbreak. Um, And so really having some like uh, planning and training about what what response ought to look like. Um, And then I think it's really important to just work closely with the communities who are involved with and using this technology um, and figure out, you know, whether or not there are ways that policymakers could support them. Like they all want to, um, you know, make sure that their technology is used in a secure way. Um, And so talking to them about, you know, how to build a good relationship uh, between the people who are, you know, uh, doing the security work and the people who are doing the actual science, I think is, is really important. Um, and just in general, I think a lot of thought needs to put into, needs to be put into like what security ought to look like. Hmm. Are there any technologies specifically that you like to see developed? You mentioned one just then, but is there anything that entrepreneurs or academics or engineers could be working on that would be helpful here? Yeah, I think that there are, um, you know, a bunch of areas. I mean, um, so I am not a scientist, and so I think a lot of people might be able to come up with things that I haven't even thought of yet. Um, but some areas that I think um, people could do a lot of good, um, one of them is in the area of countermeasures. So... Um, you know, designing um, uh, diagnostics that would, you know, function well in a world where we were facing novel pathogens as opposed to uh, pathogens that we already already know about. Um, you know, designing um, point of care diagnostics, so diagnostics that a doctor could just use on the spot and immediately get a result, as opposed to diagnostics where you have to take a sample and then send them to a lab to then analyze, which can be way too slow in, uh, in a crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, thinking about um, platforms for rapidly designing vaccines and treatments uh, that are broad-based enough that they could function for you know, multiple different pathogens, so they might be useful if we saw something new. Um, so I think all of those are really important areas. And we talked a little bit about things like designing um, you know, uh, biosafety measures that could be baked into synthetic biology. So um, you know, biologists thinking about ways to make it really easy to um, design a synthetic organism that wouldn't be able to you know, survive if there was an accident in the, in the environment. Um, I think that that's really important. And then I think that there's a lot of work to be done on the surveillance side, too. Um, So thinking about technologies that could help us notice uh, outbreak more quickly. Like, is there a way to work with... um, So Google did some really interesting work um, called Flu Trends, where they analyzed... Um, people's searches and we're able to use search data to notice out, flu outbreaks sort of about at the pace that um, the CDC was noticing them. That, that stopped working, right? Yes. Um, so that didn't sort of work in the long run. Um, but I think that there's a lot of stuff in that realm um, where uh, there's like data out there that we don't know how to make use of. So, you know, is there anything that we could do with like uh, electronic health records um, so that if we had, you know, more people than usual showing up to a hospital in a local area, uh, you know, people could notice sooner. Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential for, you know, innovations, innovations in that area. It sounds like you, you're more into surveillance maybe than prevention or treatment. Is that just more what you know about? Or do you think that that is perhaps the highest leverage thing to, to lean on? Um, I think I'm actually pretty agnostic. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I would say I'm like pretty agnostic about that. So, I mean, on the, on the prevention side, like all the non-proliferation stuff I think of as sort of prevention, I think of that's, you know, incredibly important. Um, and then on the, um, you know, treatment side, um, I think that I might be, and this is just my intuition that I don't have a ton of confidence on, um, I might be a little skeptical of the ability to just like, um, as an individual, expand the quality of treatment and response given current technology. 
Um, Because I just think that there are so many different places where an outbreak could occur um, that that's like a, it's pretty tough to know um, exactly like, um, you know, where the most sort of valuable place is and what's most neglected there. But I think um, there's a lot of research that could be really important on the response side. Um, So, um, you know, all of the stuff around, um, you know, researching uh, diagnostics and countermeasures is sort of in in the response area. And I think that that can be, um, you know, really vital. Um, And a lot of the sort of policy, I think there's a lot of room for policy advocacy on the the response side too. On prevention, what about trying to stop humans from having contact with wild animals? Is that something that anyone is actively trying to do? There's um, a a little bit of work on that. Um, And the name of a couple of the organizations I know that work on that um, is escaping me. Uh, One of them is called the EcoHealth Alliance, actually. Um, But there are a couple of other organizations that have done some work on that. Um, It strikes me as something that, like, um, I would love to see more of. Um, I guess... My personal intuition is that it doesn't strike me as the highest leverage thing to work on um, for a few reasons. One of them is that it's almost exclusively focused on the natural outbreak problem. Um, And because I think that there's a potential for man-made outbreaks to be even higher impact, um, I'm a little bit more optimistic about interventions that would be useful for those scenarios or in both scenarios. Um, and the second reason is that even if you improve techniques for you know handling wild animals, um, you also need to find a way to um, get them implemented. And I think that that's a really difficult problem because it requires changing the behavior of just a really large number of people who can be, you know, there can be cultural barriers there. It can be you know, difficult to scale that and have you know, the communication necessary. Um, and then, you know, for each different animal population, there are probably going to be different techniques, um, which makes it seem like a little bit less leverage to me. Um, but I know, you know, a bunch of people who work in the area who I really respect, who disagree with me and think that, you know, this ought to be a priority. Um, so yeah, don't, don't totally take my word for it. Sure. And on the, uh, treatment side, what about developing a lot of slack vaccine production capacity so we can very quickly scale up production or we have a lot of, uh, you know, vaccine research scientists kind of waiting around, like maybe doing something that's not that useful right now, but they're ready to snap into action uh, when we need them to. Um, So those both strike me as very good ideas that I'd really like to see happen. Um, My concern with both of them is about whether or not they would be sort of sustainable, um, especially sort of politically. So if you have all of this slack uh, vaccine capacity. Um, there's just going to be the question of how you keep it slack. Mm -hmm. And I think that you might be able to keep that, keep it that way, you know, for a little while, but eventually you'll have sort of a minor outbreak, um, of, you know, a sort of common disease. I think people will react against the fact that you had, you know, slack that wasn't used. Mm -hmm. Um, and eventually, Uh, You know, policymakers are going to say, like, what are we doing leaving this open? Mm -hmm. And so to me, what seems most promising um, is, you know, sort of more risky blue sky research into ways to just lower the amount of time that it takes in the first place to manufacture Mm -hmm. um, vaccines and countermeasures. And I think that that's going to be probably where the where the big gains will come from. Perhaps the ability to quickly uh, redesign a vaccine yeah. facility so it can switch from producing one thing to another. I think that that type of thing would be, would be really valuable. So thinking now about what uh, people listening to this could concretely do, someone's listened to this and they're, they're convinced that this is a serious problem, uh, something that they would uh, like to help with. Uh, what should they study now? Perhaps if, if they're young and choosing their major or maybe what should they do a PhD in? Yeah, so one thing that I think is pretty unique about this field is how interdisciplinary it is. Um, so there's you know, a lot of important social science to be done in policy research. Um, there are 
defense and diplomacy and military aspects. There's sort of hard science, biology, and microbiology aspects. Um, there's sort of like tech and, intra and entrepreneurial aspects. Um, and then um, there's also sort of like medical science aspects. Um, and so there are, I think, a lot of promising avenues um, for what one might study, what background someone might want to have. Um, and I can sort of talk through one of those. Um, but I would say that um, one thing is you want at least, you know, some background in biology, something that I don't really have and, and wish I did. Um, and so I think that that's definitely something that someone would want to would wanna focus on. Um, and I think, you know, as we go forward, it's possible that synthetic biology in particular has a chance at being a really sort of important technology that both, um, you know, might be associated with a bunch of risks and also, uh, you know, might be really promising for things like, uh, you know, developing countermeasures quickly. Uh, so I think having a background um, in that area could be really valuable, but there's, you know, plenty of work to be done for people who, who don't have that background. And then something that I think is a big gap in the field um, is because of the way that, you know, academia is sort of siloed um, and also most of the work at government agencies is like siloed within a particular agency. Um, you have this problem where it's a really interdisciplinary area, um, but most people are sort of specialists in a particular area. Um, and so I think having people who have a broad background in sort of several of the required areas is, you know, incredibly important. So it can be, um, you know, tough when I ask someone whose, you know, whole career has been in um, developing surveillance so that, um, you know, hospitals notice more quickly or ministries of health notice more quickly when there's an outbreak and ask them, what would you love to see change about, you know, the way that vaccines are developed? Um, and, you know, they, they really sort of don't have that, that breadth to, to really know. And I think especially policymakers, you know, really need to have that type of breadth. Um, and so I think, you know, whatever specialty that people go in, um, having, you know, uh, some really intentional efforts to like network broadly in the community and get to know colleagues in sort of neighboring areas um, is, is really important. Um, so then I guess to be a little more concrete about, you know, specific, um, you know, areas that people could go in, um, you know, one of the major, uh, possibilities is to, um, you know, look into epidemiology, um, you know, studying, um, you know, how to forecast, um, once an outbreak occurs, how serious it will be. Um, looking into the effectiveness of different types of containment measures. Um, epidemiologists are also often the sort of first ones who arrive when an outbreak has been detected, um, but nobody knows you know, what the pathogen is yet or how many people have been infected. Um, the CDC has a really, um, a program with a really great reputation um, where they train field epidemiologists to, you know, go around the globe and sort of be these, like, first people who are, you know, sort of disease detectives. Um, so I think, you know, going and getting training and getting a PhD in epidemiology um, could be really valuable. Um, I think it'll also be useful um, for people who might care uh, in particular about, uh, you know, risks from biological accidents. Um, we really need some people who care about that issue, um, but are epidemiologists and can do the sort of like cost benefit to say, you know, if, uh, you know, a certain type of pathogen were released, you know, how risky is that exactly? Because um, the people who are mostly microbiologists, you know, their specialty isn't always on the like, um, sort of like macro health issues of like how how will people react to this and how fast will it spread and like how many um, people do we think we get infected? So I think that that's, um, you know, a really important area. Um, there are uh, various, you know, really great uh, PhD programs um, in epidemiology. Um, and, you know, I can't list them all here. And someone who's, you know, working in any of these areas really ought to um, get some advice and mentorship from somebody who's an expert. But uh, there's been some really great 
um, work done by Mark Lipsitch on some of these issues, who's a, a epidemiologist at Harvard's uh, public health school. Um, and then the Center for Health Security is a think tank at Hopkins um, that uh, you know was given a grant by my um, old employer, the Open Philanthropy Project, that has some researchers who work on these types of issues. So um, I think connecting with those folks would be a really great way to work in the field. Um, could both be a, a potential you know job for somebody who wanted to work in the field, and also. Um, might make Hopkins like a really attractive place to study uh, epidemiology. Um, I think there are other paths in uh, microbiology and synthetic biology and really getting involved in that type of technology and thinking about you know, ways to innovate and uh, you know, make sure it's safe, make sure it's secure, and also uh, find innovative medical uses for it. Um, you know, Harvard is a great place to do that type of work too. Um, Stanford is also... Um, George Church at Harvard is sort of a top synthetic biologist who also has worked a bunch on safety and security issues, who's thought a little bit about ways to really change the technology to build safety mechanisms into it. Um, George Church was involved in the development of CRISPR, is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, And um, yeah, Drew Endy and Megan Palmer at Stanford um, are both, um, you know, really... uh, great sort of experts on synthetic biology who have uh, thought a bunch about safety and security issues. Uh, Megan Palmer in particular has thought a bunch about the sort of social science and um, working on building a culture of safety and security and sort of what that that looks like. Um, And then there's, you know, you could have a more medical and health research focus. Um, So I think traditionally, if you're going to go work on pharmaceuticals or vaccines or diagnostics, you might get like a MD and biology PhD sort of dual degree. Um, And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not really an expert in sort of the best schools to go to for that. But I think um, the things that you want to look for are both um, going to a highly ranked school that will give you a lot of options and making sure that there are mentors there who share some of these interests and can sort of help you get get integrated into the field. And then secondarily, um, I think it would be a good idea, if possible, to look at the departments you're not studying in and see if there would be opportunities to collaborate with people in neighboring fields who sort of also work on these issues. Um, so I think, you know, being somebody who's getting an MD but um, you know, is collaborating a lot with synthetic biologists, I think would be, you know, really, really valuable. Hmm. So we got medicine, biology, synthetic biology, bioengineering, social science. Yes, I think economics, international relations, politics is like a, a very wide range. Of yeah, there are some specific, that... um, you know, defense programs hmm. um, that um, you know, focus on uh, on biological security. I hmm. think that um, King's College uh, has one, although I'm not positive in getting that right. Um, so yeah, I think that that would be something to look into also. Um, there's a, a professor at Columbia, Jeffrey Shaman, who's working a lot on disease forecasting mm-hmm. and trying to ask, you know, how quickly once we um, you know, know about an outbreak, can we try and forecast where it will spread to um, what to kind sort of, of guide the, the response? So he'd be asking what are the leading indicators of yes. how it's going to go. So what things can we see in the first week that will... Trying to use actually techniques from weather forecasting mm. and seeing if we can use that to forecast sort of the spread of an epidemic. Um, and, you know, that would be really valuable for resource allocation during a response. So you've just added security studies and military work and I guess also data science, yep. and potentially machine learning also come into it. So there's just an enormous range of potential yeah, areas of expertise that could be, could be relevant. Yeah, that's right. It seems like, yeah, this problem is very unusual in having a very large kind of surface area. There's lots of places where you can start trying to, trying to get to grips with it and making a difference. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely right. Yeah, I guess especially compared, say, to, to nuclear security, another catastrophic risk where it seems like if you're not part of the, one of the relevant countries and you can't get into the decision-making apparatus there, then you're somewhat cut out of the situation. Yeah, and it's pretty centralized. Um, so I know a little bit about the nuclear security industry, and there's like a 
pretty small set of programs where most of the experts all come from. Um, and the community is sort of very well, uh, you know, organized and has like a lot of like methods for collaboration. Um, and that's less true for, um, for biosecurity, which means there's sort of a pretty big diversity of, um, of paths someone can take. And I'll mention that one, um, opportunity that open philanthropy, um, has funded that um, I think might be really valuable for sort of early career professionals in the area um, is the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Program, um, which is run by the Center for Health Security um, and uh, you know, selects fellows to take um, a few days, a couple times a year to go to meetings where they um, you know, all meet each other. It's a networking opportunity. They get introduced to tons of experts um, and they are able to really sort of um, have an opportunity to talk to and collaborate with people from other fields who are also interested in biosecurity. Um, I think that that's uh, both a really valuable program for people to potentially apply to once they're working in the field. And it's also a good way to just see a list of different people who are all working in the field and see the types of opportunities that are out there. Hmm. So you've listed quite a few places to study and some potential PhD supervisors or people to speak to. I don't want to stop you if you want to list any more. Is there anyone else or anywhere else that you wanted to, to get out there for people to look at? Um, so I think uh, thinking about MIT's um, uh, synthetic biology program would be another place to... Um, to look into. Do, do you know any specific people there who are? Um, uh, yeah, Kevin Esvelt Kevin is um, a young um, researcher who's worked a lot on um, gene drives and synthetic biology um, and also is really interested in safety and security issues. And he might be um, you know, an interesting person to, to work with. Um, and uh, Joe DeRisi at UCSF. Um, is a synthetic biologist who's worked a bunch on um, on security issues um, and also on medical issues um, and could be someone really interesting to work with. Uh, Berkeley also has a really great synthetic uh, bio, bio and genetic engineering program. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of sort of options there. Um, and then um, a few medical schools that um, really do focus on, um, on these types of issues that might be good places to go, especially if you're interested in doing something like um, actually being actively involved in on-the-ground response. Um, University of Nebraska at Omaha um, is one of the places where a lot of the people, uh, the Americans who got Ebola and then got sent back to the United States were treated, um, and they have a real focus on sort of um, rare infectious diseases and do a lot of work training people internationally on how to respond to them. Um, and um, uh, Emory um, is another really good school for those types of issues, I think in part because it's in Atlanta and uh, it's also where the CDC is based. And so there's a lot of sort of crossover where uh, professors at Emory will also you know, work with the CDC on projects. And those are medical schools? Those are medical schools. Medicine. Um, also public health at University of Nebraska. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can compile all of those into a list that uh, people could, people can scan through if they're yeah, looking for potential good. places to study in the in the episode notes. So, uh, once you've you've studied, perhaps you've done a PhD. What are kind of some smart early early career steps? Uh, like, how could you how would you go about building a network, perhaps, and learning like other relevant skills that would really allow you to make a difference? I guess one thing you suggested is trying to be interdisciplinary. Yeah. So I will give you some thoughts. Um, I will also add that, you know, I do not have a career in this field. <laughs> and so I can talk about, you know, what some of the people I've interacted with um, seem to have done. But I think the best piece of advice I can give is to really um, don't be shy about reaching out to people who have the type of career that you would like to have mm. and sort of getting their advice and seeing what they did. Um, but, um, you know, some uh, types of things that, um, you know, people tend to do, I mean, there's I think a lot of opportunities in both the tech and pharmaceutical industry to work on vaccine development. Um, then there's a lot of areas in the government. Um, and because there's no sort of existing market that pharma companies can count on um, that will necessarily buy vaccines that are only going to be useful in a crisis, 
Um, it means that a lot of the work happens in governments or is funded by governments. Um, so there are parts of the NIH that work on this. Um, DARPA and IARPA um, both think a lot about uh, biosecurity and about um, you know, risks from emerging diseases. Um, BARDA in the Department of Health and Homeland Security. What's BARDA? So they are the uh, Biological Advanced Research Development Agency. I want to say it's what the acronym stands for, but it's part of the um, uh, Health and Human Services uh, Department in the United States that specifically works on trying to help um, medical countermeasures that would be useful in outbreaks get from like the very early stage research into development. And so they sort of pick up and sort of subsidize and work with um, companies to like um, do that type of translational research um, and often have you know some role in helping to set priorities for what types of research in this area the US government will fund. Do you see much opportunity for people to contribute through entrepreneurship, so starting their own uh, for-profits or perhaps non-profits? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of room there, um, especially just on the innovation front. Um, and so um, I think that there are not enough people trying like really blue sky risky ideas for research that could lead to systems that would let us develop um, countermeasures really quickly for novel pathogens. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of room in biotech for, for people to do that, that type of work. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that would be, you know, a really good opportunity for a lot of folks. Yeah. So in terms of building a network and getting to know these people, you, we should just, uh, email them. Is that, is that how to go about it? Or is there a conferences perhaps that, that you could go to where, where people could, yeah, meet people who are do, doing the re relevant epidemiology or the relevant medical science? Um, so there are a couple of, um, main conferences and they are slipping my mind at the moment. So we can maybe put them up, uh, in the links later. Sounds good. Um, the, so I think that that's, you know, going to conferences is one, um, you know, opportunity. Um, the Emerging Leaders in Biosecurity Program, mm -hmm. I think, is another sort of main yeah. convening area. Um, a difficulty is that because the disciplines are so siloed, there's often sort of different conferences for each discipline, which makes it a little harder to, like, network in this field. Um, the CDC... Um, also has some training programs that I think would be really good ways to get involved in the field. So a lot of people start out in their field epidemiology training program. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's sort of a good way to, to build a network too. And that's just called the CDC training program? It's the CDC it? uh, like field epidemiologist training program. Yeah. So we've, we've mentioned a whole lot of different labs and organizations over the last few hours. Are there any like agencies or organizations you'd particularly like to highlight that you think would be good places for people to go work early in their career? Um, yeah, so some of them I mentioned already, but the um, Center for Health Security is um, a, a big one. It's a think tank. It's one of the few think tanks that's really focused just about entirely on these, on these issues. Um, IARPA and DARPA, I think, are two of the um, branches of the U.S. government that are willing to fund you know really risky research on this type of area and sort of have the latitude to do that so i think that those would potentially be really good career paths um ditra the defense threat reduction agency at the defense department um is one of the main uh you know sites of the defense department that works on uh preventing the use of weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. and i think that that would be a really good sort of launching off point um uh so yeah those are those are this several ideas, um, but I think that there really is, are a lot of ways to, to sort of enter this field. Yeah. So looking a bit more... Also working in Congress, I think, mm. is another... Opinion. Yeah. I was just going to say, looking a bit more broadly, are there uh, positions for journalists? So like any, any particular like journals you, or like newspapers you could work at that, that are covering this? Um, looking, looking like not in particular? Yeah, I think... Um, it would be incredibly valuable for that to exist. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that there's sort of, I think you'd have to sort of create your own create job, your own job. Um, right, right. which seems strikes me as totally plausible. Mm. Um, Vice mm. did 
a particularly great series on sort of outbreak prevention. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean that they're like looking to hire like a bunch of full-time journalists to work on this type of stuff. Hmm. Um, but it's at least a place to go for an example, some really good, good journalism on this issue. Yeah. What about, as so you mentioned, working in Congress, uh, so you're thinking as a congressional research staffer? Or, or yeah, as a, like, as a staffer, I think on a committee, um, okay. seems like there's at least a lot of, a lot of potential to have a, a big impact there. There's a lot of areas of, um, U.S. law where I think, uh, you really can make a big impact. What are the relevant committees? Do you, do you know? I have, have to get back. Have to get back. To you yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, what about uh, think tanks? Are there any think tanks that are doing research in this area? I think Brookings has a bit. Uh, maybe Chatham House in the UK. I think. Yeah, so Chatham on House does. Um, Brookings might have a bit, but I think it's less. The Center for Health Security is a mm. big one. Um, it's not a think tank exactly but there's an academic center at georgetown that's relatively new um run by two researchers rebecca katz and julie fisher um i can't remember what's named but it's another uh organization that open philanthropy funds that does policy research that's sort of think tank ish um uh yeah i think that the um main place i would point to are um chatham house Mm -hmm. and uh center for health security yeah I guess uh, any group that Open Phil is funding in this area is probably also... A yeah, I think that would be a good way. At. Yeah. So I'll put up a link to um, all of the grants that Open Phil has made in this area. That That's people a great can idea. Explore. And also, j- just fishing. Are there any startups, any biotech startups that are doing particularly impressive work that, that come to mind? Uh, nothing that I can name off the top of my head. Yeah, sure. So one thing that, that people often think about uh, when they're considering going into a somewhat niche area like this is what if they change their minds while they're doing their PhD or you know their life circumstances change and they want to move into another field. Uh, are people in this developing like really transferable skills that they could then like apply more, more broadly to other areas or, or are they going to end up a little bit locked in? Um, I think it depends on exactly what they specialize on mm-hmm. and on... Um, you know, how much of a transition you want to make. So, um, you know, people in this area are often really well positioned to work on, you know, biotech more broadly, um, other medical or health issues. If you want to work on like global public health and poverty alleviation, I think that there's sometimes opportunities to transfer in that direction. Um, if you work on the security side, um, working on other security related issues seems like a possibility. Um, so no, I think that there are opportunities out there for people with like biological and medical and security and policy backgrounds. Yeah. Um, if somebody wants to, um, you know, transfer into like something totally, if you want to go work in consulting or finance afterwards, I think like, uh, it's not like you'll have eliminated an opportunity but you'll probably have like sunk some time time. into it yeah but they're all pretty respectable fields with a lot of different aspects to them so you're probably not going to end up uh on the streets what are the signs that working in this area is uh gonna is is a good fit for someone are there any indicators i suppose there's so many different uh angles that it's a bit hard to make generalizations about this yeah i think that's the main thing i would say um you know i think there's a particular need for people who are, you know, good biologists, good microbiologists, um, you know, uh, so I think that's one area. Another area is people who are, um, people who are interested in the intersection of health and security are pretty rare. Um, people tend to either be interested in, um, you know, public health or in security. Yeah. And so if you're interested in and have a background in both of those, um, I think that could be a good sign. Um, and then, there's, I think, a lot of difficulties because it's such a siloed field with communication. Um, so if you realize that you feel really at home among people who are sort of uh, interested in military issues, interested in security issues or law enforcement, and also among sort of biologists and scientists or health-oriented people, that also seems like a good sign. Well, uh, you've given us so much time here and uh, so so much information. Uh, is there anything uh, I should have asked that I haven't asked? Or? Uh, nothing that I have in mind, but yeah. yeah, you should feel free to follow up over over email if anything else comes up. 
Uh, do you want to have a like final call to arms to people, uh, inspire them to, to go forth and, and solve this, this risk that we all face? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I truly think it's one of the, the most important um, issues for people to think about if they're concerned um, you know, about, about the long run future. Um, I think that Bill Gates is right to say that um, you know, if tens of millions or more people are going to die in an event over the next few decades, um, you know, this is you know, one of the risks that's most, most likely to cause it. And then it's a really, I think, exciting area because there are so many open questions um, and it's just so easy to point to areas where, you know, nobody knows what the best policy is, but gee, it really seems important if this technology is developed that somebody figured out or, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, developing, you know, having a lot of progress in developing vaccines, but it's really important that we also be thinking about, um, you know, vaccines that would be useful for, for novel pathogens that we've never seen before. I think that there's just a lot of really interesting, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, opportunities for people to do to do a lot of good. I think a lot of the areas that seem neglected in other spaces, um, it sort of feels like a bit of a challenge to take on because nobody, the reason that they're neglected is, you know, nobody even knows like what type of research would be useful. Um, and something really, I think, exciting about the sort of pandemic preparedness and biosecurity area um, is I think that there are a lot of really concrete opportunities um, to do a lot of good that maybe aren't focused on because there are, um, you know, similar opportunities with like more funding or more attention, um, on sort of more traditional public health issues. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think it's a really interesting area to work on and people should, people should go for it. My guest today has been Howie Lempel. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast. Thanks, Rob. (laughs) 